Hello everybody and welcome to my interview of Airdorf, the creator of the video game Faith the Unholy Trinity. Airdorf is a fantastic guy and a talented artist who allowed me a lot of his time to ask him questions about what's quickly becoming one of the most popular horror games of the past year. As many of you know, I am currently making a video about that video game and decided to interview Airdorf and ask him a lot of questions about his personal inspiration as an artist and questions about the game itself. During the first half of the interview, we talk about Airdorf as a creator and what led him to creating video games in the first place. And in the second half of the video, we talk specifics about the game and its story itself. However, there's spoilers for Faith throughout the entire video. So if you're not familiar with the story, come back later. Both Airdorf and his game are fantastic and deserve your support. So links to Airdorf's social and the game itself will be in the description. For the visuals of this interview, it's nothing fancy, just some gameplay I recorded of the game itself. So feel free to treat this like a podcast and turn it on while you do something else. But I figured y'all might like to hear some of the stuff he had to say. And given some of the topics we covered in this interview, I know you'll be interested in what we had to say. Either way, be looking forward to the main channel video about Faith, and if you're coming to this interview after watching the main channel, then thanks, I appreciate it. So without further ado, we are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always, thank you for watching. Hello everybody, uh, thank you all so much for coming here to listen to today's interview. Today we have a very special guest with us, that guest being Eredorf. Eredorf, uh, why don't you introduce yourself? <laughs> shoot uh i don't know if i'm that special but uh yeah uh, it's nice to be on this channel i've actually been uh, you know subscribed for a while and i actually really enjoy your uh, video essays and stuff like pretty cool content and, and like breadth of, of subject so I'm, I'm happy to be here i appreciate that that means a lot and uh, as i mentioned before we started the interview i'm a big fan of yours as well uh and what i think is interesting is a lot of the audience may not have heard of you specifically as airdorf but i'm sure they're familiar with your most famous work faith the unholy trinity um at which if you guys aren't then boy do you have a treat in store <laughs> uh, i'm working on a main channel video for that right now which should be up pretty soon this interview will probably come out first uh, but for those who aren't familiar, Faith, the Unholy Trinity is one of, if not my most favorite horror game revolving around religion or like exorcisms, demons, stuff like that. Um, I, everything from the story to the art style, I think is masterful. So first of all, if you're not familiar with it, quit listening to this interview, go play the game and then come back and listen to it uh, because Airdorf is a fantastic artist in every sense of the word and definitely deserves the report and hats off to you sir for making this this fantastic series that i can't stop thinking about <laughs> well thank you yeah that that means a lot it was very flattering <laughs> oh a a absolutely man you you make good work uh so what i wanted to do today is sit down with you and ask some questions I had as not only someone making a video about the game, but just a fan of the game in general and kind of get to know you. Yeah, yeah. Cowabunga. <laughs> Perfect, my man. Let's go. <laughs> all right. So, uh, first of all, uh, you're you're known as Airdorf. Uh, you've made this game. Um, let, before we get into topics about like video games in general, Stout, and stuff tell, why don't you tell me a little bit about yourself maybe some of your inspiration from horror in general or what led you to making video games and the kind of artistry you do now yeah um are you sitting down because this might take a while um absolutely <laughs> that's I've hey been... if you've seen my timestamps, you know i'm not afraid of it go yeah, for yeah, it yeah. <laughs> yeah absolutely um yeah i guess i've always been kind of a kind of a creative type uh, the word Airdorf comes from, uh, it's funny because my mom's here babysitting um, today and Airdorf actually kind of came from my mom because according to her, that was the first word I, I ever said when I was a little baby, but Airdorf isn't a real word. So um, I don't know what my actual real word was when I was little, but uh, I do remember Airdorf and um, she saved that, you know, <laughs> as my first word. And um, wow. that kind of... When I, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, when I started wanting to make my own stuff, I and go indie, I use that as kind of like, you know, my my flag for like or like my brand for all my creative stuff, you know, because that was kind of one of the first things I created was 
brand new word called Airdorf. So I thought, hey, that could be like a brand new brand of uh, of computer game of, you know, uh, entertainment that, you know, could really resonate with some people. And so, yeah, that's kind of the story behind the name. As for horror, yeah, I've um, I've always been interested in it. I remember the first time I played, I uh, I felt fear playing a computer game was playing uh, Doom, just the original, you know, 1993 Doom at a friend's house. Just the idea that there's this like creature that wants to kill you and it's like pursuing you, you know, and stuff like that. And it was just like a little chunky blob of pixels because like it was just like a little, you know, 640 by 480 monitor, you know. Um, but it scared me. And that kind of, you know, as I kind of got older and started getting into the horror genre, like I never forgot that experience. And, you know, survival horror games were really big when I was in high school. I remember sneaking away to my girlfriend's house to play uh, Fatal Frame. That was kind of what kind of rekindled my interest. And, um, you know, playing Silent Hill, like Silent Hill 4 came out when I while I was at high school. So I remember like going to... Um, I don't know if they have Hastings, if they had Hastings in other parts of the country than like South than like South Texas, but Hastings was like a Barnes and Noble plus Blockbuster plus GameStop plus Guitar Center, <laughs> you know, plus like coffee shop. And um, they always had like the latest games you could play. And I remember playing the demo for Silent Hill 4 and being like, whoa, this is crazy. And um, so that kind of uh, maintained my interest. But yeah, I didn't start making games until um, probably like almost 10 years after that, like, you know, maybe nine, 10 years after that. Uh, I liked making like little board games and stuff. And when I was 11 or 12, I would make games. Um, there's this program called Zelda Classic, which is like Mario Maker, but for um, like OG Legend of Zelda for the NES. And I would post my little, you know, custom modded like files up, up on the community boards for them to download and stuff. So I had a, I had experience like making games sort of, but yeah, Faith came out of this desire to um, make a horror game after PT in 2014, which is still my favorite horror game of all time. Um, it's not the scariest horror game. I reserve that for um, Power Drill Massacre by Puppet Combo. <laughs> and, um, <laughs> I totally forgot about that game until you just said that. <laughs> yeah, and I'm not even tired. I'm not even talking about like the new stuff that um, what's his face is trying to do with it. Um, the old, like, just you know, twenty, what was it, twenty twelve, twenty thirteen? I don't know. It just seems like so long ago. Power Drill Massacre came out. Uh, that is like hands down the scariest experience I've ever had with a game. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> God bless Puppet Combo, man. He's he's keeping the adrenaline pumping for all of us. Um, and uh, but anyway, PT came out in 2014, and it was just such a such a revelation to me. Like it was, you know, before before any of us finished it, knew it was a Silent Hills uh, kind of playable teaser. It was just this kind of like thing that popped up, you know, on the web and and on the internet and on you know message boards and social media. We were all trying to kind of figure out what it was and unravel all the mysteries and the fact that it took such a minimalist approach to like explaining things and like um you know with the mechanics and stuff but it still still scared the hell out of me really got me thinking and i wanted to it really it it made me want to make a game of my own by that time i'd been subscribed to a lot of let's players who did horror games markiplier being the chief amongst them and i'd been watching him for so long that i felt like i had a good idea of what would at least scare a high profile youtuber so I was like, hmm, what if I like made a game and tried to get it mark tried to get it in front of uh Mark and some other YouTubers and see if I could, you know, get some reactions, get something going, you know. And I wanted to make something like PT, which was like 3D, like first person, um, you know, pretty pretty nice looking graphics. And at that time, like Unreal 4 was starting to get popular, but I didn't really have the patience to try to like learn it and stuff. And I was going to school for animation but i wasn't much of a like graphics programmer so i had my doubts about that and uh, i was cooking up a a game idea since 2015 about like an exorcism and stuff and originally faith was going to be a point and click like horror game kind of like the um bad dream series i don't know if you've heard of that um it's like a hand-drawn style point and click horror game yeah i, I believe i've heard of that before 
Yeah, it's like the one where you you keep getting your fingers chopped off, and your little your little hand pointer keeps like bleeding all over. <laughs> right, that, yeah, yeah. Really I, funny. I, I I remember that. <laughs> yeah, and um, so I, first I wanted it to be like that, and then I was like, no, no, I want it to be like PT, you know, like have like you know really cool stuff. And um, then I thought to myself, I don't know how to do that, and if I'm really serious about making a game, I need to do something that i that i know pretty well and that i would be really motivated to like actually finish and would be easy enough for me to like get right technically and so i i have to be a big fan of you know like retro era uh games you know i grew up on the og game boy you know game boy color nes uh snes you know n64 and stuff i was a nintendo kid growing up i heard i didn't have a, a playstation or anything or xbox um I thought to myself, okay, so what if I made a horror game that was just using like super basic graphics? Like, there's no real scary Atari horror games. What would it take to get people scared of, you know, a game that was like 192 by 160 pixels? Um, so I started working on Faith, and it wasn't even called Faith back then. It was just like uh, I started out recreating the hunting mini game for OG Oregon Trail. You know where it's sort of like tank controls, and you have to like pilot your guy around, and the bullets yeah, go slow, yeah. and like a little bison will like dance on the screen. And I was like, what if instead of hunting something, something was hunting you, and you didn't have a gun, you, you were like a priest with a cross? So that's what kind of informed the whole part in chapter one, where you're like in the woods. You know, like the trees mm. look conspicuously like the trees from the oh, from okay. The hunting mini game from uh, you know old apple II, you know version of um, you know or dos version of of oregon trail yeah i see it i see that yeah and i um i hate myself for this but i lost the original sketch i actually sketched it out in church <laughs> um, <laughs> of, of michael, michael chasing um Oh yeah, I have a story about that. But um Michael chasing, you know, a player through the woods and Michael's just kind of this like blocky spidery thing. And I, I wish I had that sketch because that was like the very first time I put anything oh, down man. on paper about faith. Yeah, uh, that's have, hey, that's faith lost media now. Think about that. It is. It is. Someone wants to rifle through the garbage, uh some landfill <laughs> and find it for me. Uh that'd be great. K okay, thanks. Um yeah, and I I do have drawings from another game I wanted to make. It that was a a, a point and click like puzzle game and amy is in it like there's a girl in a dress that has a, a hole carved out of her face and a um, an arm coming out of that hole and um you actually use a camera flash to find her in this like basement which basically describes part of chapter one and part of chapter three in faith so i like kept ideas around that i wanted to put into stuff and uh, and that precedes faith by like at least a year and a half um, so i have like old old drawings of like concepts and stuff but um nothing nothing from that first time when i was like okay i really want to make a game i think i'll have a little spidery character that looks like this you know so anyway um i started working on it in like 2016 and i got it i got the first chapter i called it the demo but it was really just the first chapter and i put it on itch.io with like no marketing you know i didn't i didn't know that faith would <laughs> go anywhere i had like zero <laughs> confidence that but i just wanted to put something out there because i saw sites like itch.io which i thought was which i saw as kind of like the band camp of of games it's like any any schmuck can can put their game up on there for people to see and to share and and even charge money for us so was like i want in on this you know and i saw that markiplier was sourcing a lot of the games he was playing uh, and you're gonna hear his name a lot so I'm sorry if your viewers don't like him. Like he's the first YouTuber I ever subscribed to, and um, I have to meet him. If this my year. viewers don't like Markiplier, they can't. They're not allowed to watch my videos. Oh, I'll, okay. I'll block him. <laughs> it's fine. You know, you know, I met him. I can say this now, but I met him on the set of the Iron Lung movie because uh, David Szymanski's a. Oh a wow! Awesome. Um, so and um, and Jack Septicai was there too. Uh, it was really no funny. way! Uh, That's awesome, man. Very cool. Congratulations. Yeah, great. Oh yeah, I can I can talk about it now, but yeah, I was with David and I just met him and we were admiring this um set piece that was in the big uh warehouse that they're filming at and I heard a voice behind me go, Hello there and <laughs> <laughs> it turned around and it's Mark and and he uh, He said the thing. <laughs> no, yeah yeah, and ironically enough, Jack Septic I did not in fact uh, or Sean did not in fact 
uh, introduce himself by saying top of the morning to you. So I was, I was disappointed. <laughs> just kidding. But I turn around and Mark's there and he's like, you're the, you're Airdorf, the creator of faith, aren't you? I was like, yeah, that's, that's me. Thank you so much for, for playing and for making your videos. He's like, oh yeah, we're going to be filming a stunt later on. You should stick around. I was like, so you talk exactly like you do in your videos. <laughs> he, in just, real life. he is always the presenter, always ready to go. That's so funny. Yeah, he's real. He's real chill and uh, real humble. Uh, but man, he he took um, he took filming and producing and directing and writing for Iron Lung so um, so seriously. Like he is passionate about about that IP and he wants to make like the best best movie he he want he can. So um, well, good, that's awesome. Just my little, that, that, my that, little that's plug great for to Iron hear. Lung. That, no, that's yeah. awesome to hear. Markiplier was a huge inspiration to me about the whole idea of like just make the video, just start doing YouTube. I looked yeah. at him a lot as kind of an example for it. So that, that's really awesome to hear. Yeah, and um, there were parts of Faith, because I'd watched him for so long, and I knew that he hated, like, mannequins and stuff. He has a thing about mannequins. I specifically put in a mannequin jump scare <laughs> in Faith with the hopes that, like, someday, seven years later, he would play it on his channel and um, and get scared by it. So it sounds a little creepy, wow. but there are specific parts of the Faith games that I designed specifically to scare Mark <laughs> that, that goes along with my philosophy of, of making games that will that will read well on on streaming and on YouTube channels because if I could you know my philosophy was from the very beginning if I can get a game that um, I could get in front of four million people you know which is um, typical viewer count for youtubers like you and and you know, and, and upwards, you know, from, uh, with other, uh, channels, then that's, that's several million people who are looking at my game. And from that pool, some people might like it enough to, um, throw some money at it on itch and, you know, support my work. So, and that really worked out for me not to toot my own horn, but like, um, that was a, a stroke of luck that, that I'm glad I, I went forward with. Um, the rotoscoped cutscenes and the text-to-speech audio came later, like much later, um, the rotoscope stuff was almost an afterthought until I saw how cool it looked uh, when I showed it to a friend and he like jumped out of his seat and screamed uh, <laughs> when he saw that uh, oh yeah yeah shout out to my friend Chase he's in the er inner circle in the, the credits of the game and um, I can always count on him to have a good reaction to horror content because he's a real scaredy cat when it comes to horror games <laughs> you'd like call me and be like hey I'm playing Alien Isolation again can you come over and play for me <laughs> can you sit in my and, room um, and make me feel better <laughs> yeah yeah um so we'd, we'd have a, a therapy horror game session um but yeah he was the first person i ever showed it to besides you know like my wife and my mom i guess and uh he was like yelping and screaming and stuff i was like oh cool i might have something going here so uh the voices were originally just like stuff that i acquired from the internet like michael um if you play like an early build of faith or see some of that footage uh, floating around uh michael's like aggro uh sound effect was just um a pokemon call from pokemon silver wow. uh, slowed down a little bit yeah that's insane but it, was really jarring. Okay. it was really jarring so i was like what if i didn't get sued by nintendo and instead <laughs> do something you know that's still kind of scary so i remember using text-to-speech stuff uh when i was in in um like spanish class and stuff class computers came preloaded with like text-to-speech software so we would mess around with that um and then i remember uh like peasants quest on homestarrunner.com and like trog the trogdor games and stuff they used um the software that i was using and i found like a kind of like an open source um kind of depreciated uh like emulated version of a text-to-speech program from like the Commodore 64 days and I read the manual and I started tinkering with it I was like this is actually kind of cool um it, it straddles a line between you can hear it you can understand what they're saying and you can't understand what they're saying so it's it's sort of like fear of the unknown but like audio that was kind of my philosophy and yeah it just started using that and then the rotoscope stuff came from like watching uh, like old Spongebob or like marvelous misadventures of flapjack where they had these like meticulously detailed and grotesque close-ups that almost looked like real life you know and um the new spongebob new spongebob episodes do that but not not quite as effective like 
like all of new spongebob is not as effective as old spongebob but right that's for another video essay but um <laughs> yeah it's just like kind of stuff like that and um you know the rooscope stuff wasn't hard i acted it all out myself that's why amy has such like strong broad shoulders in <laughs> chapter one um and she, she you know uh, she looks a little more like a 17 year old you know girl um in chapter three because uh my wife uh, who's very petite was doing the um rotoscoping for her in chapter three um but yeah in chapter one it was all me okay um oh yeah i didn't tell anyone i was working on faith um uh, until it was until it was released um and then when i made like my first uh like hundred bucks on itch i was like hey honey um so i did something i made a game and um it's actually kind of selling and people are starting to kind of like notice it and uh you know, uh, how about I take you out to the Brazilian steakhouse this week? <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, my, uh, my wife actually really doesn't, she thinks that games are a complete waste of time, but, uh, I've kind of turned her onto them a little bit more now that I've, I'm starting to kind of make a living off of it and stuff. So she's been, she's been incredibly supportive all these years and, um, well, good, good man. Happy gave to some hear really that. good advice about, yeah, it gave some, it's just, you know, <laughs> I can't get her to sit down and play games unless it's like, uh, a party game like a like mario Kart or, or yeah like mario party or or uh jackbox um but anyway um yeah that's kind of how it happened i i was not planning i wouldn't i'm still in denial that faith is like a big deal um i still don't see myself that way but i mean i do recognize that it's got got some like attention um a few people recognize me on the street at gdc when i wore like my mortis shirt wow and stuff um so like weird things like that are happening to me but like at the beginning like i was just trying to i was just trying to get into the game maker space you know as a creator i wasn't didn't have any big ambitions i didn't even think i would sell anything uh i had no idea that like years later people would be like writing songs on youtube in tribute to it or making like three hour lore explanation uh, video essays and stuff and um i had no idea i would meet people like you know like you or uh, Ger gerard completionist or um or markiplier and stuff you know my heroes you know from the internet and um be able to associate with them and um you know jesse cox you know he was you know getting faith in front of him was a big deal because now i'm uh publishing a game with him uh which i'll will eventually announce but well congratulations uh, that's that's fantastic to hear wow it's funny how this like because like I can't describe my game in detail to like people in my family or at church, you know, because uh, I don't want to <laughs> freak people yeah, out. Yeah, for certain reasons. I mean, it's funny because I like I teach Sunday school, but I also made this game about demons, about like a demon hand clawing its way out of a portal to hell that was carved out of a seventeen-year-old girl's face, you know. And yeah. like, oh yeah, how are you on language? Because I'm uh, going to quote someone who said the f word. Uh, yeah, yeah go for it, a hundred percent. Okay. You can always censor me. Um, so Andrew Holschult, who's the music guy at New Blood, um, you know, he did music for uh, for Dusk and a Medieval and a bunch of other stuff, um, like Doom Eternal. <laughs> and um, <laughs> we would do our weekly meetings, and uh, Dave, you know, Oshry would be like, "Okay, what you got this week for us, Dorf?" And I was like, "Okay, so I think I figured out the lore for this demon. It's like, um, uh, it's this uh, cultist who was like jealous of Amy, and she she's trying to be like Gary's right hand, you know, woman." And she gets jealous, so she performs a second death ritual on herself, but she goes a little overboard, and she uh, she gets 490 newborn babies and passes through them through a portal of hell that she carved <laughs> herself out of her own face. And it kind of overloaded the system and created this giant demon, and it's it's like she's more demon than person now. And, 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 and like, Dave is like, yeah, all right, okay. And everybody's kind of silent, and then Andrew pipes up, and he's like, Erdorf, I just have one question. What the fuck is wrong with you? <laughs> like, <laughs> like I don't know, man. I just get these ideas. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> like I don't even consider myself that extreme in like the media that I consume. Like, I like horror films. I don't like a lot of gore. Like, I I I like The Exorcist, but I I I would never watch like Terrifier. You know, like, so I don't really consider myself like that, like edgy or horrifying. But um. I don't know. I, I had a consistent vision for what, how I wanted this like demonic universe to work, and um, luckily, New Blood. And I'm I'm going to shill New Blood a lot in this interview, um, especially Dave. You know, he he his whole thing is maintaining 
artistic freedom for the creatives that make these games. There's hardly any uh, interpolation by the publisher as far as like content, as far as like stuff you want to put in. I mean, look at Ultra Kill. There's an entire uh, romance visual novel um, stuck hidden in Ultra Kill. Like, you know, yeah, there's an yeah. entire Banjo Kazooie clone, or no, um, Crash Bandicoot clone tucked away inside Ultra Kill, you know? And that's because Dave, you know, in New Blood, they respect the creative freedom of the, you know, it's part of my contract that I maintain complete creative freedom over my IP with New Blood. And um, so, you know, I was free to be as like crazy as I wanted. But yeah, it's like whenever relatives come over, they're like, oh, we've heard you've been doing so well with like your video game creation. Like, what's your game about? And I'm like, oh, uh, it's, uh, 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 you, you know, know. <laughs> it's it's kind of like the Oregon Trail. Um, and like once upon a time, long a long time ago, I was thinking about going to business school and getting my MBA and I got invited to like a recruitment dinner. So I'm, you know, and I'm sitting there with like six other people and there's like this MBA faculty there and he's got to be like in his 60s or 70s. The best way I could describe him, he's like an academic good old boy, you know? Yeah. yeah. And um, he's there. And these whole things are just like weekend long recruitment interviews. Like they're watching your every move. So I'm sitting there and they took us out to a nice place. And this faculty guy at the table says, hey, I'd like to get to know all of y'all. So why don't you introduce yourselves and um, and tell me, you know, what your business related, you know, activities have been that, you know, that you want to relate to this uh, MBA application. So there was like, well, I interned with Google, uh, you know, I was an intern at, uh, you know, with Vivint and I got this award and I spearheaded this project or like, yeah, I led a, a non, uh, it was like that scene in, in Legally Blonde where like they're doing orientation. And everyone's talking about their impressive lives. And she's like, I was in a sorority, you know? <laughs> and um, so they're all talking about how impressive their credentials are that, and that, and you know, how much they deserve to be in, in the business program. I was like, well, I make computer games. Um, and they're like, and they're like, Oh yeah, cool. What kind of games? I was like, I was like, well, I believe in being honest in the back of my head. So I was like, well, um, I made a game called faith. Uh, have you ever played, uh, the Oregon trail? And uh, they're like, oh yeah, I think I think I've heard of that. I was like, well, it's it's like the Oregon Trail mixed with the movie The Exorcist. And, <laughs> uh, it was the first time I'd ever said something like that in front of a crowd that like didn't wasn't like contextually prepared for it. So I kind of like laughed after I said it, and uh, I got some like nervous laughter. And this like professor was like staring at me like I had just said something really offensive, you know. For all I know, he was you know for all I know he probably went to church, you know, and was like offended by that idea, you know. And yeah. by the end of the night, he gave his personal recommendation that if it was up to him, he would accept everyone at the table into the business program, except for me. <laughs> and I was wow. sitting right next to him. I was sitting right next to him. And, you know, I did like a Jim Halpert, like, look at the camera moment where I was like, thanks, dude. <laughs> but it's OK, because I it's OK. I still got in, but I, I declined. <laughs> I, I went a different route. But, <laughs> um so that's like an example of like how awkward it is for me to kind of talk about my subject matter. But uh, I'm just, I really like horror. Like the, the, the idea that you can experience like fear and the adrenaline and the fight or flight and like the dread, you know, fear is so much more than just, you know, feelings of shock. You know, I believe in jump scares when they're appropriate, you know, but I also want to dig deep into feelings of like paranoia and dread and isolation. Um, so as long as I can, and as long as I don't get bored of it, I want to make horror games, and I'm constantly on the on a quest to make, um, not just entertaining games that like are you know affordable that'll actually run on your PC, you know. Um, notice I didn't say Mac, <laughs> um, and um, and sometimes Linux. Um, but I I'm on the quest to make the scariest horror game that anyone's ever played, and whenever mm. I get a, a an email. I get I get funny emails too. I get funny reactions to faith. On the one hand, I get um, you know I'm religious. I go to church. I'm a believer. Um, I don't really care if other people are believers or not. That's just you know my thing and my family's thing. So I get messages from hardcore Catholics. I'm not Catholic, by the way, um, but like devout Catholics who are like, "Hey, I really love faith. Like it's such a um, it's such a cool story. You know about right. You know about the power of the Lord over over evil and stuff." I'm like, "Yeah, cool, man." And then I'll get messages from like atheists who are like, man, I love faith. It's such a like scathing, 
uh, referendum on organized religion and the concept <laughs> of faith and stuff. Like it's a great commentary. I was like, yeah, yeah, cool, man. <laughs> like, cheers to that. You know, <laughs> like I'll, I'll take all y'all. You know, it's like, hey, um, you, you, you played the game. That's that's all that counts. And I, yeah, and I think that means that I I did something right, uh, probably by accident, and that's that I made faith like not preachy, but still about a subject that I think a lot of people can relate to, like. I think that people can relate to having made a mistake and wanting to make up for it and then finally getting your mm. chance and feeling like you really don't want to screw this up or, um, or, you know, times when you, when you're like, you know, am I a good person? Even though I feel like I do good things, you know, even I did this one thing, you know, how does, how does forgiveness work? You know, how does repentance and redemption actually work? You know? Yeah. Um, those are themes, religious themes and spiritual themes that are very close to me. So like, that's about the extent to which uh, John Ward, the protagonist of the game, is like a self-insert. Other than that, he, it's just my appearance, you know, right. from the rotoscope cutscenes. But uh, yeah, it explores that kind of stuff, and uh, I'm very happy with the how how many people interpret faith in in so many different ways. I'm very mm. pleased that it's open to interpretation and that people do interpret it in in different ways. Um, that's what I wanted to do with the game. So that's mm. kind of my spiel uh for faith i have i have many more horror games that i would like to make but uh, i want to kind of baby and nurse faith um and give fans what they want for as long as they'll let me you know mm. uh because it's it's an important game to me it, it changed my life when i uploaded it to itch.io that one you know that day in in 2017 you yeah know? yeah of course so, of course and, and you know i get messages from people who are like yeah i've been suffering from like depression and anxiety and stuff and playing faith actually helped me out i was like i don't know how that works i still recommend therapy but you like that's really cool <laughs> to hear like that's really cool to hear because um you know if if i can make someone make just one person's day or just you know scare the hell out of one person um that i feel like I, I will have done my job you know yeah yeah absolutely i i think like it's real interesting what you said about faith kind of appealing to different people in different ways um something that really hit home for me and it's fine that you mentioned you're a sunday school teacher i've mentioned this on the channel before but i'm also a sunday school teacher oh, cool. um, yeah I, I go to a baptist church i've taught uh, a uh, uh we call it college and career so it's like you know college graduates or people fresh or college age students or people right out of high school uh, I've taught that class for a long time. So I'm very religious myself. Yeah, right on, man. Yeah, yeah. Very, very big believer, which is one of the things that attracted me so much to faith. Because when I played the game for the first time, which I did it on stream, I'm sure a bunch of people listening saw my reactions. I didn't go into it with like the Christian or believer mindset because so much, you know, demonic exorcist media has no connection to actual, you know, religion or stuff like that, right? Like, yeah, it's just like Hollywood stuff. Yeah, yeah it's like like the Exorcist, right? They, they pick the word Pazuzu out of a book of demon names, right? And yeah, sure. they're like, yeah, and now the scary girl's going to barf blood or barf on the priest or whatever, right? Like, it's, it's just the aesthetic of religion. So I didn't know anything about you or didn't hear anything about the game. I just heard it was good, so I started playing it. And as yeah, I was yeah. playing it, I was like, okay... Like, I'm seeing, like, I, I, sure, the names pop up, like Malphus and, you know, stuff like that. It's like, okay, so whoever did this did their homework. Gary, you know. You know. Yeah, 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 exactly. <laughs> Gary, you know, one of the classic demon names. Yeah. Um, but as I'm playing it, and I, I start to see stuff like, okay, Antichrist, like, it's explicitly religious. And then I started to pick up on themes specifically with John, like, his regret, yeah. his struggle, and then, the, I wish so badly this was on stream, but when I did my original stream, I did the whole game through. It took nine hours, and I died maybe 20, 30 times in that last boss fight. <laughs> that was probably pre-patch. <laughs> oh, it was. <laughs> yeah. I remember wow. that. Hey, you're dedicated, man. <laughs> like, not a lot, a lot. I lost a lot of players. <laughs> oh, well. That. So, uh, Gary fight. so I, I, I did the Gary fight eventually, and then I got to, like, the secret final boss fight, you know, like, where you go into the Crucible. Uh, slight yeah. spoilers for those who haven't played it, but you, you're, you like, 30 minutes into an interview. You did instruct them to go out and play it. Yeah, 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 you're yeah. 30 minutes in. It's your fault at this point. But at the end, when I went into the Crucible, I just kept dying in that final fight over and over. 
uh and i was like okay stream I, or chat i can't be here i've been talking for 10 hours straight i'm gonna take a break so i finished that fight offline like to myself and man i wish i had recorded or done something to get my reaction because i finally beat it and you know they like the the rush of adrenaline like yes finally we did it and then it's that cut scene like gary gets destroyed like haha woohoo we're, we did it uh and then it's amy and then like so something about john saying amy i'm so sorry and then her like it's okay and i start i was like to myself i was sitting there and in a way i'm kind of glad it was to myself because it was so much more personal that scene where um john, yeah. i realized like it's a redemption for john like he sure he should have done it then but now he has the providence to do it now and man yeah like oh my gosh you did ah the way you did this okay I'm, I'm just nerding out sorry but i had comprehended like i had taken notice of the cross being different colors through different chapters yeah. But I didn't, like, I remember being in chapter two and being like, oh, it's silver, that's unique. And then in chapter three, I'm like, oh, okay, is it like wood or something, whatever. Like, I didn't connect it. Man, <laughs> when it's that last cut scene of him standing there holding the golden cross and he says, amen, dude, it was, I got chills all over. I'm like, this is a game about faith. Like, uh, again, to different people, the game means different things, and I'm not devaluing that. But to me, as a Christian, I'm like, this is a game about a man retrieving his faith and his purpose in the face of these insurmountable odds. Like, how cool is that? And that's when I became obsessed with it. Yeah, um, that scene is, uh, thank you for that. It's really interesting discussing the game with a, a, you know, a fellow believer. And I hope we don't turn off your like non-believer fans, like, you know, geeking out about Jesus over here. But it, I did, <laughs> I did make the game with that perspective, you know. Now, there's no getting around it. And I think um, the reason why I did that. So uh, what's interesting about that scene is that um, I had another game developer um, who's who's a you know, who's Christian, who's a believer, suggest that there be a um, suggest that there be a scene where um, John has a near death experience and he uh, he receives the the you know the glad tidings the he he gets the well done thou good and faithful servant you know and um you know from god and yeah, he yeah. can make the choice to 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 rest you know to go go on or to come back and and do more work and i thought that I, and i was trying to be nice i was like well that that sounds really sweet but i really didn't want it to be that obvious but i needed to i needed to have a good ending for john so i was like you know, John needs a savior at this point. He may not have the maturity, you know, to, uh, it's sort of like, um, one of the, one of the most powerful experiences I ever had with the concept of forgiveness was, um, you know, I had, I had did something to a friend that was really, really wrong, like really, really bad. And it really tarnished our, our relationship and stuff. And we didn't speak to each other for like a year. And I finally, when I finally got the guts to call him, and say that I was sorry for how everything went down. The first thing he said, and he, he wouldn't let me finish. He said, dude, it's okay. I forgive you. And he was, he wasn't even a, a believer, mm. you know, um, uh, he's, he's always been like a self-described, like agnostic, you know? And, um, in that moment, the, uh, I, I felt it, you know, I felt it stronger when I, when I knew I had been forgiven by him, than the precognition that I had already been forgiven of my sins by christ so there's something mm, um wow. there's something really special about making peace with someone you know and um i need i i felt like i there needed to be a moment where john made peace with amy it doesn't fully make sense because like she was possessed she still had the hole in her face but she kind of turns back to her old self and to me it was kind of like the idea of amy saying it's okay like i was a victim of these people and you did everything that you could to stop to stop them, you know. And you know, sometimes we just need someone here on Earth to tell us that it's okay, you know. And uh, you know, say what you want about like going to confession if you're a Catholic and stuff, like the ins and outs of someone saying you're forgiven or telling you what you should do to be forgiven. 
But I think it really does mean something to have someone that you've wronged forgive you and tell you that you forgive them. So that moment right there is is very personal to me, you know. And uh, yeah, there's there wasn't going to be this cheesy, you know, and, you know, and, you know, Satan come, appears to John in the form of an angel, just like in, you know, the Bible kind of warns us about. Yep. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that um, that's what's yeah. actually oh, happening. Oh, I, so that's another thing. One of the other reasons I like you so much <laughs> and like the game so much. When I was reading about that online, it's like, I, I, what's he called in the game files? It's like a being of light or a, a figure of light. What what do you call that vision of him that John sees? Oh, I don't know. Um, let's see. I, I've got my... I got my cutscenes pulled up here. I forget what I call them. I give them weird names. I mean, Michael was named Abraham for a really long time. Oh, interesting. Um, yeah. Um, and then I changed him to Michael because I, I kind of wanted him to be uh, like an anti an anti Archangel Michael in that he's kind of like a gatekeeper for diving further into the game. So like if you got past him, oh, you know, I see. kind of descend further. Oh yeah, there's all this symbolism and stuff, you know, like... Um, there's a part in chapter three that talks about um, only those who have ascended to the highest can descend to the lowest, you know, um, yeah. which kind of is an allegory for how I feel about Christ, how you mm. know, only he could be the one to condescend below everything because he had power as the son of God, you know. Mm. Uh, so going from the highest to the lowest. And, and I also feel that people don't just land. This is my personal belief. I feel that people don't just land in hell. You have to like conscientiously sin against something that you know is right and good, mm -hmm. you know, rather than just being ignorant or making like a mistake, you know. Uh, and so that's kind of what a lot of that stuff and something that I think turns off a lot of Christian gamers with faith is that John does have to, he does have to go through the motions of falling from grace and further below that in order to kind of get to the places he needs to go to fight Gary. So it, it does, there's a symbolic journey. It's like Dante's Inferno, but it's not like a cathartic thing. It's like you're willingly putting yourself in harm's way as the player. So there's a lot of that kind of stuff. And uh, some people read too far into it that I'm like encouraging people to like, um, to like perform rituals and stuff and but like all that stuff is made up you know in the game um but yeah there's a ton of symbolism in the game so i'm interested to see how much of that you picked up on man i i like the game even more I, now we, we've only talked this long and <laughs> i'm already I, a bigger fan of it that is so yeah, cool what to hear. like all that thing uh i just called an angel but um in the notes but um or in the game files but you know, I forget what scripture it is in the New Testament, but, you know, Satan transformeth himself nigh unto an angel of light. Yeah, yeah. You know? And there's there's another one that's like, and no the, wonder. The counterfeit, the counterfeit idea, you know. Yeah, yeah. For, for he disguises himself as an angel of light or something like that. I saw, it may have not been in game files, somewhere someone was like, oh, the being of light appears. And I'm like, oh, that, that sounds weird. Because the interaction always made me feel strange after I played the game for the first time. Because I was like, it, it presents itself as God or an angel, right? And then it has that conversation, but then it's like, swear it. Like, it, there's this malice yeah. to it. And I was like, that doesn't sound like God. <laughs> I mean, he's, yeah, he's appealing to John's... He's taking advantage of John's desperation. Yeah, you know? yeah. John, John just wants a way out because he's not spiritually mature enough to to uh, accept... Um, accept or you know go forward with faith you know exactly. there's a part where you you go back to the to the doorway to the attic that he had blocked up and he says there's no way in hell i'm going back there which is an <laughs> ironic way of saying i'm too scared to face this thing that i was sent to fight you mm. know that was that I was sent that i trained and studied to go to war against so mm. yeah like that that whole thing is about um a deceiver taking advantage of his um his cowardice mm. And he That's, literally has to descend, oh, he word. literally has to jump into the crucible, which is the inverted the inverted crucible being the um the you know the symbol of um you know that now I'm just going into Dan Brown stuff, but you know <laughs> uh, the, the symbology of of um you know the cup and drinking the cup and taking this cup from me, you know he has to descend into the crucible, which is literally taking the cup himself 
and acting as a savior for someone else mm. you know even if there's you know not that he's not that he's a not that he's a um, replacement for christ but you know you know we're kind of his hands on the earth you know miracles still happen i believe but we still have to kind of do work ourselves yeah, yeah i, I make agree. them happen in other people's lives so you know john presents himself as the hero finally when he takes the cup you know when he jumps into the crucible mm -hmm. man that... so yeah lots of symbolism and, yeah, it, I... and it's stuff go, go... i have i have such a religious training i guess to the point where it just it's just kind of um what is it uh subliminal for me so it's interesting having this conversation with you because i'm i'm actually sort of kind of realizing for like the first time that oh yeah i did kind of conscientiously put this metaphor into the game well well like dude it's so cool hearing you say this because i also not, not to like toot my own horn but i'm pretty you know well versed. Toot. <laughs> i'm like pretty well versed religiously so I would, when, I would expect any Baptist who teaches Sunday school to know know the Bible pretty well. <laughs> Absolutely. So like when I played the game, I was like, okay, is is the developer actually doing this stuff or am I just superimposing what I think of it onto the game, right? Or am I actually being correct? Uh, and hearing you say a lot of this stuff I suspected is so cool. And it also reaffirms I'm not crazy. <laughs> like a lot of the symbolism was meant to be there. Like, one thing I loved, after I came to the realization that the, the angel of light or whatever is actually the devil or a demon or whatever that uh, appears before I John. I don't know if people, yeah, I don't know if people realize that, but that, that is Satan. Like, that is the devil. That like, is the devil, the number one. <laughs> yeah, that's why, that's why Garcia, that's why he says uh, to, um, that's why he says to Garcia, like, last year in Amy's house, I saw the devil. Yes. And he, yeah. and he deceived me. And I think I'm locked into, I think I'm locked into this bargain with him and garcia says uh what i think is uh, and everybody loves garcia and i love garcia he's like my favorite oh, yeah. character i swear i will make a garcia standalone game yes uh, <laughs> it might not happen immediately but it's coming um uh, and he says um i don't think that's true um uh, you know um you, you know that the you know that the devil is real and so you know the lord is real mm -hmm. which is it's kind of a um a reverse of this core belief that i have that is if you recognize that god and the savior exist you have to recognize that satan exists that mm -hmm. he's real and that he's a real threat like he's a real being yeah um so I, I i thought it was interesting that i ended up literally putting satan you know the you know old scratch himself in the <laughs> god himself is not in the game i felt like that wouldn't be um that didn't feel right to me just from a reverence perspective mm -hmm. um you know, uh, it felt weird depicting like God the it, Father. In yeah, the yeah. Like I, I don't have a problem with making demons look bad. I I have a problem <laughs> with making God look bad. Yeah, I agree. I I have a I have an idea of how Lucifer would act if he wanted to personally tempt someone and bring him over to his side. Mm -hmm. Um, I I don't think I have the ability to to accurately depict what it would be like to stand in front of you know God or Christ. Yeah, you know. Yeah. So out of reverence I and respect, I, I, you know, but uh, a lot of people don't realize it, that, that, that's, yeah, that's him. That's I, I think what it is, because my initial thought when I played before I put the pieces together was when John says I met the devil a year ago, I just assumed he was talking about Amy. But once I started seeing it together, I'm like, oh, no, no, no. Like that's, <laughs> no, that, that was the devil. <laughs> that's not an angel. And Amy's a really complex character because, um, and I can't exactly delineate the difference between the two, but in through a lot of the game, especially chapter two, like uh, especially chapter two, because chapter two is all it is, is an ex is John subliminally or subconsciously exploring his feelings of guilt uh, relative to Amy. Mm -hmm. That's why there's like sub this subplot of like stalking people and killing them in the cemetery. Cause they're, they're metaphors for Amy and the guilt he feels. And, um, um, you know, and kind of the the image of going through like the church and descending like deep and stuff. And the church will be more prominent in in chapter four because it's as you saw in he chapter said three. It, guys. It's kind of he said it, guys. Chapter four. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and um, oh, that's definitely going to be one. And um, yes, and but the church is uh, literally where John was like orphaned and like spent a lot of his childhood. Um, if you pay attention during the the like trip out cutscene in chapter three, you see him and Lisa as children um, 
inside the church Mm -hmm. um, with Miriam Bell standing outside of it. And um, so stuff like that, you know, kind of taps in. And, like, there are parts where it's not actually Amy. It's it's John's perception of what – of Amy's eternal fate that is haunting him. Hmm. So, like, the part at the – if you get the bad ending – uh, which I didn't realize this, but it the bad ending for chapter three is pretty dang heavy. <laughs> like <laughs> you basically get clawed out of existence, uh, just completely obliterated spiritually. Um, well, that's what that's part... what they get for going to bed every day. <laughs> that's what the players. That's deserves. what you get <laughs> for slacking off. So, like originally, uh, John was going to be able to choose to like go out and do what Father Garcia asks him to do, or like go to the arcade and just play arcade games, or go to the club and just like dance, or <laughs> like go drinking. Um, but I didn't have time to like put all that in. So yeah, it's just like sleep in, you know. Yeah, yeah. I, I <laughs> don't anyway, want to get up today. But at the very end, um, at the very end of chapter three, the bad ending, you discover that a certain character has been kept in a room in John's house mm-hmm. for like all these years, and he finally confronts this character, and it's like. I left it ambiguous as to whether that's actually her or just the the image of her fate haunting him, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah, if it's um, more so the idea so, he has locked up in there. Yeah, so there's parts where it's like, is this Amy or is this how I feel about Amy kind of haunting me? Like, in, in that way, we, we have our own demons, you know? Mm-hmm. So there's a, there's a lot of that. But yeah, um, the game's very sim- symbolic. Like, if you want to dive deeper, you can get super deep with this game. <laughs> and it just kind of, um, it just kind of happened because I'm, I'm not really a conspiracy theorist, and I don't, I don't really think I'm very like esoteric. But like, I'm, I'm pretty cognizant of like, you know, like symbolism and stuff, and you know why there's so many like visual and symbolic motifs across civilizations. You know, there's, there's language that I think at a very spiritual level we all kind of relate to or can all recognize. And um, so a lot of the symbols like, um, like the seals and the um, not like the animals, but like the sealing the demons, um, like the seal of Alu, Alu being the name of a, of a demon that's in the, you know, compendiums of the Catholic church. Yeah. But the seal that I designed, you know, to like block him from you getting to Lisa, um, you know, it's just, it's just made up for the sake of faith and stuff. And there'll always be like your upside down crosses and yeah, of course. inverted pentagrams and stuff. Cause that's fun. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I tried to be real, real conscientious about, I tried to be real. I, ha- I tried to have a consistent voice for Gary and his cult so that they weren't just like, yeah, hell yeah. Demons. Like, no, I want Gary to be like, I want him to have like a very specific mission that you can kind of, that's kind of palpable, you yeah. know? Yeah. Yeah. Rather than just like, oh, they're crazy. Like, there is a goal, an objective. Yeah, and Gary himself, um, I don't consider myself a very good writer, but I really like Gary as a character. Oh, I, I, I love Gary. I think I, he's highly entertaining. I think. Well, he like, loves you. I, <laughs> uh, you got me. Like, I love Gary, uh, and he loves me. Uh, and I personally, like, John's my favorite character personally because I did have that revelation with him that the story is about his faith and Christianity and blah, blah, blah. But taking my subjectivity out of it, I think Gary is objectively the best character in the game. (laughs) Yeah? Yeah, yeah, like, having... To give you an idea, and this is a bit of a spoiler for my video, but I have internet historian voicing him. Like reading his notes and stuff for the video I'm doing. Oh, internet internet historian. Yeah, he's gonna be doing oh, that's the voice funny. lines for Gary because I'm like Gary I like isn't that guy. your stereotypical angry groveling demon leader. He's like a charismatic dude, and uh, no, that's he's, what a, makes he's a terrifying. landlord. Yeah, he's a land he's a landlord exactly. He's a landlord. Rent and utilities are due by Friday, man. <laughs> that's a, that's such a funny note. Or I'll sacrifice. <laughs> yeah, he um. At first, I had him being a car dealership owner, um, but he's like the, he gets around, man. He's an entrepreneur. Like he um, he founded the uh, the uh, the the birth clinic. Um, yep. You know the child the childbirth clinic in um, in uh, chapter three. You know that you investigate that Amy worked at. So uh, contrary to popular belief, it's not actually a. Can I can I say the a word? You can you can say the a word. YouTube, yeah, of course. YouTube algorithm purposes. <laughs> it's not an it's not an abortion clinic. Although the idea came from this like um, this like uh, like one of those exposing the satanic web like documentaries about um, 
you know, about abortion clinics in like the 80s or whatever, and that kind of got my imagination going. But uh, no, Gary does not want to um, terminate uh, the the child the childbirth event. He wants to he wants them to be born so that he can send them to hell immediately. <laughs> like, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that I'm laughing about this. Like I'm I'm an absurdist, so like I appreciate the humor of something that's just so absurdly terrible. Like, yeah, yeah, of course. You know, and. Um, so he runs it like a business, you know, and um, he fusses at his secretary, you know, and sends her faxes. And uh, he also happens to, he happens to be a landlord. And, uh, you know, he'll tell his tenants, hey, just let you know, uh, you know, instead of like, uh, they're going to spray for bugs next week. It's like, oh, uh, I'm going to I'm going to open up a hole in the ground and a demon's going to crawl out. Uh, if he comes into your room, stay perfectly still and, and try not <laughs> Try not to acknowledge it. Or they're like, "Hey, good news! We have a special guest. Uh, the demon Alu is here. I don't know. I don't know who summoned him, but uh, we're just gonna roll with it." You know? <laughs> uh, Tiffany might be up to something, but whatever it is, just just it'll happen. It, yeah, it's Tiffany's out of my hands. Of, <laughs> Tiffany's a real piece of work. I wish I could do more stuff with Tiffany, but um, but I, I think she fulfills a good purpose. I, I think Tiffany is my favorite demon in the game or enemy type, I should say, yeah. in the game. Like Gary's my favorite character, but I love like the little kind of the short lore around the character of Tiffany. Yeah, where she's like a starstruck cultist who's like, I'm gonna one up Amy. They 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 got one one demon baby, one you know, one baby in her. Well I'll put I'll, I'll seventy put, times I'll seven. Put all of them in here, yeah. Like uh <laughs> It's so brutal. Yeah, I really, I wanted her to be a, an extremely blasphemous character to the point where she's so blasphemous that she blasphemes the satanic cult that she works for. <laughs> like even Gary's like, ugh, you know, like, <laughs> like damn, you're you're crazy, like, girl. Hey, this, um, this girl is up to something, yeah. Not yeah. Word. So that's why you go into that room where she performed the ritual, and it says not seven times, but seventy times seven. So that's like a. You know, 490 it, she put 490 yeah, it's, it's babies obvious... through her face hole yeah so it's like, <laughs> great how long did that take did they just have like a truckload of them i don't know uh, i don't want to think about it but like that was another thing where i like told them about it and andrew was like the hell is wrong with you? <laughs> and, uh, so i had a lot of fun with that um and I apologize if I'm like offending people. I'm just like I'm not like nonchalantly like discussing like dead babies and stuff. Well, I mean that like, like the kid from junior high who was all about dead baby jokes, you know. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, like you know, you're describing a demonic cult who does evil actions and whatnot. I think it's fine that their actions are sinister and terrible, um, and the laughing's just from the absurdity of it. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah I, I, it, I don't actually it, think you find dead babies funny. I think you find the fact this character exists to be humorous. I had a lot of fun with Gary. I I love the whole like inter the little sit down, the little Diane Sawyer interview with you have with him. Yeah. Like pick your questions and stuff, and he yep. just kind of laughs it off and it's like, oh, that uh, I needed to get your body and mind ready for the unspeakable to enter. You know. Yeah. Yeah. Um, or uh, you know, and then the revelation that the the twins, you know, Nate and Jason aren't aren't real. Mm -hmm. They're just uh, well, they were real, but they were a miscarriage, and and so they're just kind of a projection of Mrs. Martin's, you know, like regret and stuff and it seems and like so a lot see, of the symbolism with the twins bleeds over into john's memories and his own trauma yeah because john sees him and so lisa and john were at snake meadow hill church as orphans they were right. they weren't there during the initial miriam bell incident but they were haunted by her um which is very unfortunate now that the nun two is coming out um <laughs> i have to like distinguish her from that so that people aren't just like well 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 a demon nun uh, I'll have y'all know that I thought up of Miriam before the Conjuring movie, uh, uh, The Nun, um, and before Puppet Combo did Nun Massacre. So uh, <laughs> let, that sh let the record show. The, the twins are an interesting thing because I, I needed John to have a um, an objective in Chapter 3 that kind of linked him to Father Garcia. So both John and Garcia lost lost a child to to the other side, you know, to, to the cult, you know, um, Garcia being in charge of Michael's exorcism that his parents may or may not have really approved of, you know, and stuff like that. And so Garcia like very intensely pursued victory over that demon and he lost, like Michael got away and, uh, his, his fate is very sad and tragic. And John lost Amy, 
or he feels like he lost Amy. And so the chance to redeem or to rescue um, the twins and thus redeem themselves, I thought it was a great common goal that Garcia and John could have. Yeah. And so, yeah, like his his yearning to find the twins, you know, and thus save himself, you know, uh, you know, try to redeem himself that way. Um becomes like the central core of John's like motivation, I guess. Um, which is why neglecting that duty gets you the bad end, you know, mm. that kind of symbolizes him just like n just giving up on that whole fight, you know? Yeah. And like, and, go, go you know, ahead. I don't mean to cut you off. No, no, I'm just rambling. Go ahead. No, no, I, I enjoy the rambling that I'm here for the rambles. Uh, but what I was going to say, one of the most powerful elements about the game to me kind of going off that whole idea about John and Garcia being sort of these, you know, these champions of the faith, and you lose the game or get the bad ending because you neglect that. You neglect the responsibilities of it. Something that I like so much about there never being direct intervention from, from the holy, like we see a lot of the unholy's intervention, but we don't see like angels or God or something like, like you said, God's never directly depicted in the game. So... That was so powerful to me because I find a lot, not only through scriptures or Christianity or my own life, is that God, I, like, I agree with you that miracles are still performed and things like that, um, but God rarely interjects on humanity or on our free will. Rather, he gives us the tools and capabilities to overcome the mm -hmm. evils we face. He allows us to rise to an opportunity rather than save us from that opportunity, which allows us to grow and be better and be stronger Christians in the end because of it. So at the end of the game, when John, of course, God acting through him, but John himself overcame the cult, overcame Gary, and was able to destroy all of this, it was God not only saving him from a circumstance, but making him a better person because of it. Yeah, I, th I think that's an interesting idea. Because, you know, if you study the life of Christ in the New Testament, you know, he didn't just like, um, you know, swoop down in all his glory, be like, here's my law, um, you know, forget about the law of Moses. This is what we're doing now. It's a fulfillment of the law of Moses. Um, you know, do this, do that. Uh, boom, everyone can be resurrected. And boom, <laughs> everyone can be saved through the blood of Christ. See ya. <laughs> and, you know, it took 15 minutes, you know, he, he had an earthly ministry in the which he ministered, you know, his, mm. his hands performed acts of, uh, you know, mercy and acts of God. And, um, we don't have the power of, we don't have godly power, of uh, you know, to do those things within us, but we can follow his example of using our hands for, for good and using our talents and stuff for good. Um, I never wanted faith to be a, a, a preachy game, but, um, I felt like I had something to say when it came to my views on, um, you know, at the, at, you know, at the least at a human level, uh, redemption and forgiveness and recon reconciliation. And, um, you know, there is a part at the very end when you're fighting, uh, super Miriam th where you get like second chances, you actually get 10 chances and it, it kind of follows this prayer that John has, but the more you take advantage of it, the more bleak it becomes. And then at the end, at the end, he says, you know, how often we forget faith without works is. And then if you get hit one more time, it says mortis, which is death. Mm. Um, so there is there is that in that he finally gets some divine intervention. But a lot of that mechanically is because Super Miriam is like literally a bullet hell. Like, <laughs> it's, it's a really hard fight. <laughs> it's a bullet hell, heavy metal demon boss fight with like pyrotechnics. And at one point. Uh, the game stops to give you a break and ask if you have life insurance, you know, like, <laughs> when I describe the final, final boss of faith to people, I'm, I'm just so proud of myself because it's so like batshit crazy. Like, and uh, I really wanted to have that little break in between. Like if you fight her long enough, it, she just goes away and it plays like a funny little jingle and says, do you have life insurance, John? And like, I don't know. I just <laughs> really like that kind of stuff. It reminds me of earthbound how like the, the, the final bosses of Earthbound are just so crazy, you know, and, and like Undertale, which takes a lot of you know, ton of inspiration from Earthbound, um, and you know the the fight with uh, Flowey or whatever in Undertale is just so like insane and horrifying that I kind of wanted something like that um, for Super Miriam um, that fit mechanically and in, in, into Faith, and so 
I, I like that he did that. I, I think in later chapters, I would like to give the player the option to enable that like saving grace option to where it's not just a one hit KO every time you get like barely brushed by a demon, you know? <laughs> Right. John's very sensitive. He gets like barely tapped by a demon and just explodes. <laughs> More um, he's a tender little guy. And um so I might I might do that in future installments. I, I have an idea on how to expand on that for chapter four, but yeah, um I think it was very important that John performs the works himself to change as a person and to mm. see himself in a different way. And and Garcia gives him a chance even when when John has doubts about himself, you know, and Garcia says, I, I need spiritual warriors like you, you know? So I, uh, I think it's, it's pretty interesting. And a lot of the, a lot of the writing just comes from my own kind of feelings. And a lot of the story I, I kept ambiguous, you know, on purpose one, because I think it's more fun if you can interpret it the way you want. Um, and two, because, um, I, I can't write very well. So I just left things kind of chunky. So that people oh, I, I think you sell yourself short. There's so many writing elements in the game I love so much. Um, but I, I think you hit a really sweet spot between... I know a bunch of people who aren't believers at all who love the game and think it's great, like you were saying. And as a believer myself, I loved the like faith aspects of the game and stuff. So you, you, you hit a wire walk between preachy and non-religious expertly, I think. And I think that's part of the reason it's been such a mainstay because it appeals to every side of the aisle. Yeah, and um, and I don't really see an aisle like I I don't really see like a believers versus non-believers. Of thing. course, I know that's of not course. what you're. I know that's yeah, not yeah, what you're yeah, yeah. But like, you know, I want I want players to know that like, I mean, some of some of my some of the artists and fellow creatives that I associate with, um, and that I you know that i enjoy associate with very much are atheists and and self-proclaimed satanists and and whatever like i i recognize good art you know um and you know in all and in all you know in all its forms that i personally enjoy and i don't like to get caught up in the artist that much you know yeah yeah but you know someone like trevor henderson uh who created siren head you know i I would hate to um I don't know if he could make such compelling art if he if he didn't have a certain belief system, you know, or a certain philosophy on how things work. You know, so I I appreciate people's like personal views um on things because it gives people unique voices and I believe that unique voice, voices are uh are key to uh, enjoyable art, but um but anyway, I don't know what I was going for with that, but I, yeah, I think I got kind of lucky. I got lucky when I, how, how the rotoscope cutscenes and the text, text to speech voices and stuff kind of, um, kind of, um, you know, fell together and gave it, gave faith a unique voice. I don't know if it would have gone as far as it, as it did or gotten in front of so many people if it didn't have those things. And it sure as heck wouldn't be as memeable if it didn't have those things. So, uh, I'm glad it kind of fell together the way it did. I, like, the rotoscope was, I think, the thing that pulled me in. Like, I saw clips of it on Twitter and YouTube, and I was like, oh, that <laughs> that's what that game has? That's pretty neat. Let me check it out. Because it, it's so unique, too. Like, you almost never see it used nowadays. Um, you, you've really, like, this, this has been fantastic. You've really answered most of the questions I had about you as a creator. The one last thing I wanted to ask before we get into details of the game itself yeah, is yeah. about the rotoscoping. What was your inspiration to use that specific art form and about how long did that process take on average? Oh, <laughs> yeah, let me bring up that tweet where I like counted up all the frames of animation. Hold on. Uh... <laughs> oh, oh boy. <laughs> Yeah, cool. So let's see. Chapter one had about four had four hundred and ninety three individual hand drawn frames of animation for the cutscenes. Chapter two had around nine hundred ninety five. As of February twenty twenty two, so the game wasn't even finished yet. I had drawn two thousand nine hundred and two individual frames of animation. Oh my word, bro. Yeah, <laughs> that was so far and there's like we're gonna do an update really soon that has even more um 
sometime in September, I think we're going to try to hit the September 21st um, launch for like a, a, a new update. So there's like more to come. I used to do them with a mouse. <laughs> like, <laughs> oh my gosh, bro. Yeah, are yeah, you yeah. okay? So 15, 15 frames per second. And on the average, the cutscenes are like four to six seconds long. So yeah, they would they'd pr- pretty much take all day, you know, a um, couple of days even. And then at one point, uh, I put out a call for, um, I put out a GoFundMe to see if people would pitch in to help me get a display tablet. And um, they were very generous, extremely generous. And, um, you know, for the chance to be in the credits, uh, I asked, you know, hey, I'm thinking about this model here. Could we get to, you know, $1,000 so I can purchase one? And they were very generous. I was able to purchase one and, um, you know, keep my uh, Adobe subscription going um, for a little longer. And, uh, man, it just boosted my productivity so much because I'm a natural drawer. Like, I, I like to think that I draw pretty well. Um, and just transferring, you know, those motor skills over to creating these cutscenes, it just boosted my productivity so much. And I didn't kill my wrist, you know. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, my output just like skyrocketed after that. And I think the cutscenes look better um, since I was able to just kind of freely draw stuff. And I have an animation background. I, I was uh, I received, uh, you know, training and mentorship from like Disney animators when I was in college and stuff. Oh wow! And so uh, it, it felt like I was finally taking these cutscenes to their full potential, but yeah, it, originally they were just static images that would flash on screen. Um, I should I should show you. I'll send you a bunch of old files if you want to put them in your. I I, I would I would absolutely love to. I appreciate that. Yeah. Um, the original review reveal of Amy when um, you wind up sitting on her bed is was just a still image that would like rise up from the from the bed frame, but I thought to myself. I could do better. So I was like, how and it was, I was looking at like Prince of Persia and stuff like that. And I was like, how hard would it be to just like make like an animated sequence and just kind of, you know, what if it was uh, an uncanny valley kind of thing? And that's what I was going for. I was going for something that, you know, there's this accolade in the trailer for the witch, um, you know, a 24, 2015. Yeah. The, uh, Robert um, Edgar's movie. Yeah. Robert, yeah. And, um, there's an accolade from a critic that they put into the trailer. It says it, it says something along the lines of it feels like we're watching something that we shouldn't be watching or mm-hmm. something that's impossible. Um, and I kind of took that as inspiration. And I was like, everyone would know that this would be impossible to pull off in like Atari 2600 land or MS DOS hardware. But what if it was one of those interest in instances where the hardware you know just kind of reached out and scared you with something that was completely unexpected so if you don't get killed by michael on the way to the house then the first time you see amy is this highly realistic animated cutscene of her fingers coming over the bed frame and then rising up from behind it like like the ring you know and um and so when i tested that out i was like this is pretty cool so i decided to do almost everything like that um, sometimes I feel like the magic is kind of lost in chapter three because there's so much of it to the to where the player kind of expects it. But especially uh, in chapter no, one, no, those... <laughs> oh, okay. no, it's fantastic in chapter three. Great, great. But continue. I think it worked so well with people's first exposure to the game in that it was kind of the moments were few and far between, you know. And a lot of that was because of technical limitations. Like I was just destroying my wrist trying to draw these frames. You in, are like, correct one. that it's such an interesting design and art form. Not a lot of people are familiar with that. When everyone saw it for the first time, there was that like, what's this, you know, shocking moment. Um, mm. But I think the quality of the ones in chapter three and like chapter two, but especially chapter three are so interesting and the image is so terrifying that I think they make up for it. They make up for okay. you know where this is going. Like I think about that one of Gary injecting John and John like transforming. I think about that all the time. It's so well done. Yeah, the the freak out. Yeah, um, yeah. I really like that one. And I don't know if you realize this, but the images uh, directly mirror the lyrics to um, King of Pain by Sting, uh, the police. I, I found that in my research and it blew my mind. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So one thing that I do is I try to pick just a few, just a handful of main inspirations. And um, one of the major, ins- one of the inspirations for each chapter is a song. So um, 
the song that inspired chapter one is um, Twilight Zone by Golden Earring, uh, which is it's got a great like inter interverse like guitar solo that's like really cool. Um, but the lyrics are very dark and kind of sinister. And then chapter two is actually it's it, it's almost like a music video for Twilight Zone. Um, it even has the 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 intro card. It's two a.m., which is one of the first lyrics in the song. And um, but yeah, it was a uh, the um, what was it? Um, Pet Shop Boys, a song called Later Tonight, that was the inspiration for Chapter Two, and then it appears in the trailer. John sings it, and then King of Pain was the the a big inspiration for Chapter Three, and that's where it becomes really obvious because the imagery of these pitiful situations like a fossil trapped in a cliff cliff wall and a seagull with a broken wing that's you know that's how john sees himself he sees himself as as broken and irredeemable or hopeless um and then depending on your actions in the game he's he's pleasantly proved wrong by uh you know by acting in faith you know Mm. and receiving some redemption so yeah um i haven't figured out what song will be the uh inspiration for um for chapter four i'm thinking uh the the six flags uh party bus theme song uh I'll probably just do that <laughs> but the, you mean like that but dun 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 <laughs> <laughs> Los Del Rio La Macarena I think is going to be the inspiration <laughs> yeah I'm thinking I'm feeling the Pina Colada song that, that's like oh the yeah vibe. I didn't so I didn't realize this too recently but I, I was got bored and I recently read the lyrics to La Macarena and I was like man we like we like white people in the 90s did not know what we were getting into when we were singing along to this song like this this is a sociopath that's singing this song <laughs> Like, she is bad news, and I don't know if I I feel bad for promoting her all those years by dancing the Macarena. But, um, anyway, that's just my, my public service announcement about about that song. The dangers right? of the Macarena. Yeah, I want to do like a fake, uh, fake like Christian documentary about the dangers of of the Macarena. You know, <laughs> bro, I've I've like been like I've the had... lady who makes a big deal about monster energy drink labels yes yeah the one who's like it's the, the scratches of devil yeah, yeah. Bottom, bottoms up satan laughs you know i yep. want to do something like that but for the mockery <laughs> bro i've had this video on the back burner forever about like the satanic panic you know like the 80s when yeah everything we haven't even dipped into that <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> <No thing. laughs> like which obviously a lot of faith comes from and stuff but uh, I've had this video on the back burner forever, and like, man, the stuff people got freaked out about—it cracks me up. It's insane. Like the links watch some this, people went to. You gotta watch this documentary called "Exposing the Satanic Web." Um, it's uh, you've probably already seen it, but um, it's it's amazing. I'll I'll link it to you now. But absolutely, uh, I have I haven't seen it, so I'm interested. Yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see, what is it? Um, I think it's like liked videos. No. My nightmare fuel and inspiration playlist. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, I'll find it. Um, but yeah, it's called "Exposing the Satanic Web," and it's like if your kid is uh, if your kid is into these things, um, you know they're in danger. You know, and it's like it's like rock music. Uh, there it is, exposing the satanic web. You know, rock music, uh, coffins, uh, death imagery. It's like coffins. What what child is into coffins? <laughs> what child? Um, anyway, I I linked it to you, but um, and like I you know, don't get me wrong. I believe that Satan's out there. I believe there are ways that we can uh, expose ourselves to his influence. You know, but um, I don't think he reaches out and touches you so much as we reach out and touch him. Um, that we invite him through our actions and their purposeful yeah, actions. Yeah. I don't think that, I don't think that, um, you know, your kid has some, um, some chalk and he draws a star on the sidewalk and then you walk around it to where it's appears upside down to you. And you're like, <gasps> you know, like, <laughs> that boy ain't right. It's 6am and that boy ain't right. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> like, I'm not going to like, 
I don't be- like. I don't really believe that we accidentally summon Satan, but I think it's fun <laughs> right. to think about in like horror horror movies and games and stuff. Um, so anyway, I I really wanted like the bad endings to be like John really has to participate in some shady stuff. Like in chapter two, to get the worst ending, you have to like literally lead a child to uh, to a confession <laughs> booth where he gets snatched up by a by the mirror demon. You know? Yeah, yeah. You or, you got to like kill a kid. You have to kill the two people have on the to road. Kill the two stranded motorists. Yep. And you have to uh, you have to make a blood pentagram. <laughs> A lot, a lot has to go wrong. Yeah, yeah. I like, and, I um, like that idea. It's also one of the only games I've played where you have to work for the bad ending. It's normally the other way around. Well, you kind of have to work for the good ending too. That's why the good Christian boy achievement is like, is like the bane of so many players' existence. Like, L- they, like me. they really hate that achievement. <laughs> <laughs> I've tried one hundred percent that game. I've watched, pe- I've watched people speed run good Christian boy. Like, I... bro, those speed runs are incredible. They blow yeah. my mind. Uh, who knows? They might be tool assisted or something. <laughs> gotta, believe, gotta believe that they're real because um, I. If you look at the stats, only like 0.6% of players have gotten good. Christian oh my play. gosh! But it's we such have a, a good, hard we achievement, have a, bro. We have a reward in line for the next update for people who got good Christian boy. So oh, cool. it'll be like worth it. Besides, like besides bragging rights, it'll be Dang worth it. it in the end. <laughs> now I have to but, go go for grind for it again. I know. I know. Um, Anyway, I um, yeah. So the satanic panic stuff, and I, I did a I did an interview with um, the Chaluminati guys, uh, you know Jesse Cox and all them. Yeah, yeah. Um, where I talked about this, where um, I thought that the satanic panic scare and of the eighties was perfect, perfect backdrop for faith because all the isolationism and the paranoia and the doubt and fear and uncertainty. Not to mention the eighties were kind of scary and that like. We didn't have smartphones or GPS. Like if you wanted to call someone, you had to find a pay phone or just like drive home and hope someone was there. You know, if you're stranded on the side of the road, you had to like walk to a gas station or try to flag someone down and hope they weren't going to kill you. Right. You know, and if you picked them up, you had to hope that they weren't just like a, a drifter who was like on a killing spree. <laughs> so there was a lot of that stuff. And I thought that the eighties were kind of perfect for that. And, um, you know, I will always chill for the, a real, real world, um, kind of realistic, depiction of the 80s rather than the kind of neon you know synthwave kind of vision nostalgic vision of the 80s that like stranger things and like you know other forms of media kind of popularized right right i love i love synthwave i have a bottomless synthwave playlist that i listen to on on youtube but i i wanted to make it a little more like no deloreans but a 76 ford pinto you know which is the car that garcia drives you know and I had to make sure that I was like, okay, it's it's in 1986, 1987, but people kept their stuff in around longer. So a lot of the furniture and a lot of the cars are actually from the 70s. Right, And right. the way that people dress in photographs, for example, the um, family portrait in the Martin household, which conspicuously does not feature Nate and Jason, um, they're dressed like the 70s, not the 80s. You know, mm, so I, right. I tried to be really kind of smart about it and i didn't want this kind of like fantasy nostalgic you know of it's like it's like a version of the 80s where like reaganomics and the aids crisis never happened like Mm -hmm. i I wanted to avoid that and put in something that was real so it's like trash on the street and there's graffiti and the cops are jerks and you know stuff like that so uh yeah like just little touches like that i did a lot of research um, especially into uh, Connecticut, which I have no personal connections to Connecticut. That's just where I found the most stories in the um, paranormal subreddit <laughs> on Reddit. You know, people right, telling right. their stories. And, I mean, it makes sense. It's like you know, the it's old, it's the witchy area, stuff like that. Yeah, so. Northeast. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, like Lovecraft country. You know? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So there was like um, in Massachusetts, you know, there's, uh, oh yeah, there's, uh, Devil's Cave in Yonkers. That's where supposedly like Son of Sam and his, and stuff like that was going on. Um, the, uh, like ritualistic, uh, like dog sacrifices, like people would go out and ritualistically slaughter like a German shepherd or a Rottweiler, uh, hence the Rottweiler in the chapter two prologue and stuff like that. So like, I, I, okay. Yeah, and like Dudley Town. Um, where's that? Dudley Town is in uh, Cornwall Township. 
in Connecticut. Yeah, so like there's Dudley Town, which was like a place where people like disappeared from, and then there's there's a forest called Dark Entry Forest, like <laughs> And that you can't go into dark entry forest because they claim it is a quote nature preserve. And I'm like, y'all, y'all just that the name alone is getting my getting my imagination going. Like you don't dark just call entry. a forest dark entry. You might as well call it portal to hell forest, you know? Like you can't just call it that and not have me get interested in it and want to put something similar in my game, you know. So I believe in doing a lot of research. Um you know, Summer Night, the game that I did for Dread X Collection, which I'm I'm very proud of how it turned out. You know, uh, I did a lot of research into the, how those like uh, Tiger handheld games worked. You know, and I took artistic license by making them pixel graphics, uh, which a lot of people had a problem with for some reason. They'd like message me and be like, hey, "Tiger handheld graphics were not pixelated," and uh, you know, they're right. <laughs> <laughs> they're not wrong. <laughs> but yeah, I um. I have a lot of fun making games if uh, if you couldn't tell already and I, I hope to be able to make games for a, a really long time and, and faith was just a um i only talk about money to talk about how weird it is that i actually made money off of this game i'm not like bragging of course of but course. like faith faith did so well its first weekend it, it completely blew away my expectations for the game's entire lifetime um and when when Dave came back with the first weekend sales reports, I was like, holy crap, like I got to make more of this stuff, you know, and to me, it's a good sign because I think people want like unique voices in horror, you know, and um, I, I, I deliberately bucked the trends of like Slender clones and Five Nights at Freddy's clones, uh, which both those titles I respect a lot. Um, and like, uh, you know, zombie crafting survival games, which I don't respect. <laughs> and um just kidding. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to do something new and maybe inspire people to do the same because I had barely any experience making games. Um, you know, of course, uh, the New Blood publishing deal was uh, a huge step forward for me in my development and growth as a creative because they they really helped with all the SEO and getting in front of the right people and getting it you know in front of the press and stuff and. Uh, not to mention like Dave and David Shemansky's names alone, you know, are, uh, you know, they're, they're famous enough to kind of garner attention. So I'm really happy to be part of new blood. It was an incredible publishing deal, something that you'll probably never see in other, at other publishers. So that's why I accepted it. And, uh, I think it's, I think faith is just the start of what I hope is a long career in making, uh, scary games and someday, I would like to make the scariest dang indie horror game that anyone's ever played. So, well, I'm dude, still working. On I think I think I can safely say after Faith that you have secured that future. Uh, if anyone can make the scariest indie horror game, I believe it's you. I don't know anyone else who I think would be. I hope so. You, I, I can't I think, think of anyone else who'd be that far along, but I <laughs> I think you got a good shot. I think stylish stylish Kira or Kira and and their whole team when they made Lost in Vivo, uh, yeah, yeah, they came pretty dang close. That game was so scary that I couldn't finish the first part of the game. I had to come back like a like years later and finish the actual game. Um, same with Power Drill Massacre. Um, very few games that that actually do that for me. I get scared by a lot of games. I'm not like desensitized or anything, but like. Mm -hmm. I put Lost in Vivo up there, so I think I think when once Kira's done with the uh, Kingsfield kind of game that they're making, and um, and Spooky's House of Jump Scares is is one of my favorites. Mm. Also, mm. I I love it to death. Uh, the VR version is amazing, um, in my I, opinion. Oh, I didn't even know there was a VR version. Wow. You can you can play it in VR. Yeah, that's it's fully so that's fantastic. Wow. Yeah. Um, so it's like seeing stuff out of the literal corner of your eye instead of instead of the screen is is a cool effect well um, very cool okay. yeah chilla's art chilla's art i like their stuff um they they dip into a lot of uh japanese urban legends and stuff like um is like um inunaki tunnel and stuff like that um yeah and um like black eyed priest games i like i like their stuff um uh and i uh i respect scott cawthon for kind of stepping out of the spotlight and kind of letting his community take on Five Nights at Freddy's, but I, I really enjoyed FNAF when it was, like, the first four games, you know? I, I did as well. I liked it back then. Yeah, and uh, 
you know, and I, I still get scared by, you know, some of the Resident Evil remakes, you know, RE2 remake. Uh, I haven't played 4 yet because I was uh, knee-deep in the Elden Ring mm. uh, hysteria, and uh, so I didn't get to play 4 but yet. But I think I think I have it. I just haven't, like, played it. 4, four is really good. Uh, I, I only say that because I am a super fan of 2, of the remake. Like, I've played that game so many times. Uh, and OG Resident Evil 2 is one of my favorite horror games. Oh man, you're you're talking about the OG. You're you're classic. I'm I'm yeah. just a pleb who's only played the remake. <laughs> oh, you got to you got to play the original. But yeah, um yeah, the remake's great. I thought it was a really cool step forward. Uh I uh Nemesis the Nemesis remake kind of turned me off, but I I think they turned things around after like Village. Mm-hmm. Village did not scare me like 7 did, but Village had one part that um i will never play the game again because it means that i would have to play that part again and it was so disturbing and scary that um you know i'm gonna have to have a lot of therapy pizza before i go back really Uh, resident evil village house beneviento yeah that oh oh oh, yeah of course yeah the baby (laughs) the most the most most, it i hate the person who spoiled this for me because one day i was on i was on uh youtube it was just on a thumbnail the 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 creature from that segment it was like is this the scariest resident evil game ever (laughs) and it had like a big arrow had a big arrow red arrow that was like it said demon baby or something like that i was like oh thanks pal and um, appreciate it i'm so i was so mad at that so it was absolutely spoiled so i did not have a moment where i was like what is that like an umbilical cord on the ground oh my god like i didn't have that moment yeah um, but i still really enjoyed that sequence just because it's the least Resident Evil Village segment of Resident it Evil. It is, Village. it is, for real. And like and that yet I, and yet I loved seven. I, I, I loved almost every minute of seven. Seven is among my favorite horror games ever. If not that's really the horror game that pushed me into horror games. Uh that and Dead Space, because I went back and played those around the same time. But like Bro, I'll tell you what. <laughs> <laughs> I played Resident Evil 8 the day it came out because I love 7 so much and I was excited for 8. So I got to experience that whole House of Benevento segment in earnest for the first time. Man, it was wow. so good. Great horror. Yeah, I'm jealous that you had that experience. There's some things <laughs> I wish I could kind of selectively wipe my memory of so I could experience it again. PT being one of them. Mm. Yeah, uh, PT was like- great. Yeah, games like um, like Vanish and um, and uh, Lost in Vivo and um, and other stuff. Um, I wish I could kind of. I wish I could have the experience of of li- going through that again. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, I I don't get to play as much horror games as I would like because I'm making games, and that's kind of like the catch twenty two of doing what I I love doing. Mm-hmm. Um, but I'm always on the lookout, and I and I play, I play everything. Like I'll, I'll play, you know, stuff with like no reviews on on Steam or you know the most obscure itch.io titles if it if it just kind of looks cool to me, you know. Um, but yeah, I've let's see, I'm I'm really excited for Concluse too. Uh, a lot of people don't realize it, but Concluse was was pre haunted PS1 demo disc, uh, mm. PlayStation One horror. You know, wasn't quite, uh, wasn't quite before Puppet Combo, but the guy who made Concluse is one of the um, originators. And I was right there during Pets Cop. I desperately wanted it to be something more than it was turned out to be. And um, you know, Paratopic and Pony Island. Like I love all that stuff. Mm-hmm. I need to play a. I need to play a Inscription. Um. I I know uh, what's his face, the guy who made it. Um, through twitter and i haven't played inscription yet but i did play his game jam game that went on to become inscription so um uh, yeah i'm and, oh yeah i was playing signalis uh, signalis is gonna wipe the floor with me at the horror game awards i just know it um and then pizza tower is gonna completely obliterate me in the game maker awards that they're coming out with but that's all right i'm happy to be even named among great titles like that yeah, absolutely, man. I think you absolutely deserve it as well. So uh, we talked about a lot of your inspiration, a lot about like you as a creator and you as a storyteller. Uh, but given that this video is over faith, I also have some questions about the game itself. Yeah. So 
one of the things I was thinking, like we've talked a lot about kind of the themes and like the overall aspect of faith and the character and all that, but there was some specifics from within the game itself, uh, like certain moments with characters and things like that, that I found interesting and want to bring out in the video. And one of those, or at least chronologically, one of the first ones uh, that comes up is the subject of Michael. So yeah, yeah. Michael, for, you know, for those that don't know, crawly, rake looking, creepy thing running around on the floor. Um, he kind of shows up in chapter one, is hit by a car or a, tra a tractor trailer, which is very funny. Yeah. Um, and then what, like there's elements of Father Garcia in him that we see in chapter two. But Michael himself doesn't really show up outside of things like the bad ending for chapter three. Right. That's true. So what to you is Michael's significance in the story? And is he deeply related somehow to the workings of the second death cult? Yeah. Um, I wanted to leave, uh, I wanted to leave a lot of that kind of ambiguous. Mm -hmm. Um, and feel free to do so, that here too, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, sure. Um, no, I, I'm, I'm fine expounding on stuff. Um, uh, yeah. So Michael was originally named Abraham and he was originally an old, an old man with like facial hair. Mm. Um, like the guy from, um, the possessed old man from, there's a movie called the unborn, which is, I didn't like it. Uh, but, uh, I loved horror movies. So I, when I was a kid, so I went and saw it and there's a really creepy scene where like a, a Dybbuk or something. Cause it was like a, it was like a, a it was that kind of like Jewish spiritualism. Um, was like possessing people. Anyway, I was kind of going along those lines and I thought maybe he could look younger and just be kind of ambiguous, just kind of a little spider boy. So I changed the name to Michael because I thought like naming him after an archangel would kind of give him like a, like kind of like gatekeeper status or he's like a herald to, or he's like a preclude to the, um, to getting deeper into the story of faith and kind of, getting deeper into the whole nightmare i guess and um yeah he's mostly just kind of a mysterious you know antagonist that um just kind of stalks you and i didn't really think of his backstory with father garcia like garcia being involved with him until maybe the later half of the dev cycle for chapter 1 so Garcia is in chapter one, but he's like very fleeting moments. And so Garcia's there because he's drawn to Michael because he has unfinished work business with him. So he's just kind of there. <laughs> Michael and Garcia have this kind of twisted father son relationship, which is why if you shoot Garcia out in the woods during the ending of chapter one, uh, Michael will get his revenge on you. And, um, there's not really a consequence for shooting shooting Michael and having him get get run over, but um, anyway, yeah. I and then of course I explored a little bit more of how he escaped and 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 stuff. So my original thought for Michael was that he's just um, he's you know another demon possessed uh, human, and he's just kind of drawn to the activity around the Martin home, and he's just kind of kind of there to kind of gatekeep the player from the rest of the game you know if they can if they can successfully navigate these woods while this creature is like coming after you then you know you play the rest of it you have access to the rest of it so that was kind of my thinking for michael and then the ending for chapter three i needed someone to kind of uh i decided to give him a kind of a cameo at the end where john kind of uh gives himself up um at the end uh at that ending so that was kind of it um i don't i haven't really fully fleshed out his like significance in in the large in the in the string of things now if you don't tell anyone i'm being facetious about that um, <laughs> there was a like a silent hill resident evil style like 3d survival horror game that i was working on that was starring father garcia where you played as him oh wow and, and it was in between the time that Michael escaped Garcia's apartment and the time that you see Michael in the woods. And Yo. it, it, 
it would have taken place in an in an entire town that Gary had, and the cult had taken over, and Garcia ha- like kind of gets into this town and he can't get out because the cultists kind of block everything off, and he has to like fight his way out of it while and while Michael's like taunting him and stuff. So there's a little bit of closure uh, in there was going to be a little bit of closure between Garcia and Michael. Like there's going to be, there would be a part where Garcia, you know, fully realizes that Michael's probably can't be saved. He's too far gone. And, um, but he can't kill him, you know, but he also knows that it's going to need a lot of work to get him back. You know, um, if Mike, if the original Michael, you know, the, the boy is still in there somewhere, you know, or if he isn't just fully gone. And, uh, there was going to be a part where, uh, Garcia, met and confronted Gary too. Um, so that his encounter with Gary at the end of chapter three is more like revenge, you know, or payback than anything else. Um, so I had all these interesting story ideas and stuff, and I've, I've got like a little game design document, a little sketchbook where I read, like draw ideas and stuff. And I, I might make that game someday. It would be a lot of work, but that's kind of um, some backstory to Michael that, um, if if one played that game a, a little more of his purpose would would be explained i suppose or make more sense but yeah he's just kind of a little a little spiderly guy i didn't, I didn't really <laughs> he's, I he's came up with a lot just of kind second, of a little fella <laughs> running around kind of a little jerk yeah <laughs> um i came up with a lot of the cult of the second death stuff um kind of after the fact um i i really got into it uh i really started kind of developing that group towards the end of chapter two and of course in chapter three. So, you know, in chapter one, a lot of that stuff is really ambiguous. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like, like I saw some people online who were kind of confused by Michael's connection. They'd be like, so what, is he just an unrelated demon? But to me, when I first played the game, I saw it as Michael in an unrelated instance is possessed. But then when he becomes possessed, the first thing he does is run to the cult of the second death. Like what the cult is doing is so important. All the demons are in on it. Uh, yeah, yeah. So to me, that kind of contributed as world building. Like some of the monsters we could be facing may not even be from the region. They're like converging on this town. Um, uh, so, I mean, it always made sense to me. And I, I especially like his conclusion. It's all Michael's like, especially that, uh, the rotoscope of him crawling on the ground is probably one of the more <laughs> famous elements of the game, I would say. Yeah. Yeah, that was... Um, that's Mixamo. So I just used a mocap, found some mocap data and slapped it onto a little little character. Oh, cool. Um, so it was like cool. a Mixamo animation of him crawling. Yeah, so that's not actually footage of me doing all that stuff. I was about to ask, uh, is that you crawling around on the ground? <laughs> no, 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 that's mocap. But uh, I used mocap for... a some of the stuff a little bit of the stuff in in faith to do the rotoscoping but um yeah um yeah that was that was more what that was about but yeah i um i really like how that how that creepy little little crawling and anim- rotoscoped animation worked out yeah it, it it's very uncanny like you said spider-like one of my favorite things about, like, the rotoscope, which I didn't realize you could do with it until you did it with... Like, I didn't realize in general rotoscope could do it until I played Faith, is you can seamlessly blend, like, human, quote-unquote, normal things with, like, mm. supernatural broken things. Like, you can have someone standing there, and it's like the animation everything of a person, but then their head can fly open and an uh, arm reach out of it and stuff, and it all looks fluid. Yeah, that comes from my um well the the way I did that was I I filmed myself reacting as Amy as if the the hand was coming out of my face and then I just um filmed another version of me just kind of, kind of like sticking my arm up and like flailing it around and I kind of used my my college um you know Photoshop you know After Effects um skills to kind of kind of paste it all together and stuff and and then you just kind of um and then you just kind of draw over it <laughs> and um yeah i like that i liked kind of the unsettling part like um i really like uh how the uh, there's a part in chapter three where john turns around and he sees amy kind of crouched and then like a hand comes out of her mouth you know yeah yeah and kind of a precursor to what happens to her after she performs the set or they perform the second 
death ritual on her. So I, I love um, that that cut to where it's like John's slow turn and the camera gets closer to it. I, I really like that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so stuff like that, and I, you know, I have very limited kind of experience with like cinematography and stuff. But I feel like I have enough to where. Um, you, know, you sure fooled me. <laughs> yeah, it's funny because, um, you know, I, I've never really, uh, I didn't exactly go to film school, but I took like film classes and stuff. So I, I, I think I just dabble in enough to be confident that, you know, I can make some, I can put something together, I guess. I guess that's what I'm trying to Yeah, yeah, of course. I th- I think you're more than competent. I-, I think the game's reputation speaks for itself in that matter. <laughs> I-, I think you did all right. <laughs> right. Um, so, yeah. But, oh, the other thing I want to mention about Michael. Uh, he has a lot of, like, creepy quotes when you, like, shoo him away and stuff in Chapter 1. And yeah, yeah. Th- the most interesting one to me is uh, I have the body of a pig. Which, <laughs> you-, you got that from the old, like, creepypasta video, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's an old old video that i um i don't know i thought the way it was presented was scarier than the actual um the way the video was presented was scarier than the actual like evp you know supposedly yeah and and there's like sort of a face in the dark yeah yeah i i talked Um, about it i think i was in an interview with mr gg but i talked about how that video always bothered me as a kid uh, because I had learned that like old Canaanite gods that are actually demons and stuff, like they would present themselves as a bull or a, an eagle or a fish or something like that. And then yeah, hearing I have, I had, uh, or I have the body of a pig, it bothered me for so long. Still does. Yeah, yeah, because there's that uh, the story of the swine and stuff in in, in New Testament. So. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so I it was just like a random thing because the thing was is that the text to speech is like just ambiguous enough, or it's it's just garbled enough to where people are like, "Huh, did I really hear that?" And I really liked that, so I thought I'd throw in some stuff like like that and see if people notice. And yeah, people noticed. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was a great touch. I like it a lot. Um, okay. So cool. All right, so that kind of answers some questions about Michael. I like the theme that he has sort of this twisted father figure relationship with uh, Garcia, so to speak. And while we're on that topic, I wanted to ask about Garcia himself. So yeah, yeah. Garcia is, he's definitely, like I said earlier, Gary's probably, I think the best. John's my favorite, but Gary is, I mean, not Gary. Garcia is objectively the coolest <laughs> character in fact. Yeah. That, that scene, especially where um, he shoots Gary with a shotgun. <laughs> like Fantastic. I love it. Yeah, that whole scene of him being like, don't be afraid, and then he cocks the shotgun and stuff, that was a lot of fun. It's so great. It's fantastic. I send that to people all the time. Just, not even people who play Faith, just like the, the image of a priest with a shotgun. I love it. Yeah. Um. So, like, Garcia, he shows up in Chapter 1 because he's out looking for Michael, uh, and he's kind of, like, obviously the ending where you shoot him and stuff isn't canon, like, so the, the canon parts we see, he's just kind of there, and it's not until chapter two like within john's dream and then of course in chapter three where we see more of him so yeah yeah. garcia is seen knowing about a lot of the things john knows about right like he he's familiar with the twins he's familiar with amy and stuff like that so how does or at what point i know it's off camera and stuff which is why i ask at what point does garcia come to know of this cult of the second death and ally himself with John. Yeah. So there was a, I can understand why it's a little confusing because there was this entire, um, Oh, Hey, sweetheart. Oh, well, you can choose one or the other. I think, I think mommy's going to take you to bed now. Okay. Go with mommy. and be sweet. This is so cute. Good night. Oh, we can tomorrow Saturday. We can play tomorrow. Okay. <laughs> that that was adorable. She broke into my. She broke into my house. That was so adorable. Wow. Oh yeah. Congratulations. Little, little yeah. Thanks. Um. <laughs> she is actually in Faith. She is the voice of the babies in the Mother Secret Box. Really? Yeah. So Yo. All the crying and the, la- the, crying and the giggling is. Uh, my daughter 
uh, baby wow. girl coming along. Wow, that's insane. Yeah, yeah. and um, you know, well, now we can pay her as an employee, right? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and um, my second child, he is in chapter three. Um, I put him in. Uh, there's a new cutscene right before the mother boss kicks off where um, the baby in her arms turns around and looks at John and he's got the same face as when he gets um, when he's tripping, you know, and like running around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, scratchy face. So, yeah, both my kids are in the game as as well as uh, as well as Mrs. Dorf. She was the model for. That's uh, so cool. For Amy. Yeah, it's 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 fun. You got to use the resources that you have, right? Yeah, yeah, that's so cool. I love it. I love the idea of incorporating your family into stuff. I mean, it's like it's it's like a legacy cemented. You know, your whole family is a part of the game. That's awesome. Yeah. So, like, um, you know, fifteen twenty years ago, I'll be able to show them. Um, you know, I'll be able to show them that they were in the game. Yeah. Good stuff, my man. Very cool. Very cool. Um, but, but yes, uh, Father Garcia, you were saying. Oh, right. Uh, let's see. What was I saying about him? You're, uh, talking about his connection to, like, the second death and stuff, like how he found out about him. So there was this whole, um, so he does his own, he's doing his own, um, investigations, you know, and he contacts John. Um, the, the, um, so just how, I think the way I wanted to explain it was that, and I didn't have, like, time to do that um was um let's see um just like how garcia appears in john's dreams john appears in garcia's dreams oh, you know, so it's, you know, div- okay yeah so it's like divine providence um you know it's like divine providence um kind of putting them together and setting interesting. them up. Interesting. So okay, Garcia, okay. Yeah, excellent. That makes and sense. This Not a lot of people know this, but um, in Chapter 1, it kind of implies that Garcia is kind of watching John. And in I was there was going to be the subplot where um, since John has um, clown phobia or whatever it's called, he's afraid of, he has an irrational fear of clowns. So if John, this was going to be a whole subplot that just didn't make it into chapter three. Is that if John chose to go to like the arcade or he chose to go to the roller skating rink or you know go out and hang out and just do do nothing all day instead of um, uh, stopping the second of, death, yeah, instead of going out and doing his dang job, you know, that he would have fun for a little while, but then a clown would come and and scare him. <laughs> so that was actually supposed to be garcia disguised as a clown scare trying to scare john straight basically oh like, okay basically is... trying to keep him on the straight and narrow in his own kind of weird way but i was like that that kind of doesn't work for garcia i don't want him to be like a goofy character is that why um, the clown nose shows up in garcia's apartment that is exactly why you there are cool clown noses cool okay apartment. that makes sense that makes a lot of sense and okay. i i dropped that subplot for chapter three which is why there is no clown nose in chapter three so i i can confirm that it that object is not in chapter three or is it (laughs) yeah yeah so that's kind of garcia's thing is that he was supposed to be watching and testing john while he was doing chapter three is the thing but what it ended up being was that john is that garcia kind of was doing his own investigation and um you know he was having visions of of john you know and um you know garcia is not the one who puts everything right it's it's john so um you know garcia is just kind of a uh he's like the virgil type in dante's inferno you know just kind of like a guide or something or like a jiminy cricket type where he's like his conscience and stuff right right um you know but you also see that garcia can be really forceful like he he has had enough of the second death and the unspeakable and he wants to go to war with them and if you if you finish day three, so if you finish the daycare and Gary Land and all that stuff, and but you but you slept in on one of the days, like you did, you skipped over one of the days. Uh, John will express like a lot of self doubt about yeah. like that he's like ready, and then John will pull out the shotgun, point it at John, and say, "You're coming with me, basically, whether you like yeah. it or not. Yeah. Like we're doing we're doing this together." And so it's 
you know, Garcia's got kind of a, you know, he could be a crazy old man, you know, for all John knows. But uh, yeah, the original like subtext was supposed to be that Garcia was simultaneously watching and testing John throughout chapter three to see if he was worthy to really undertake the the bigger picture. Interesting. And that was kind okay. of yeah, that was kind of lost, and I didn't I didn't mind in the end that 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 um um you know that that didn't really come to fruition but yeah that was kind of the original kind of behind the scenes um reason for all that okay cool cool yeah that makes a lot of sense that also explains the clown i was that was something i was wondering about garcia always struck me as like like kind of you said like the sage of sorts like a sage with a shotgun but <laughs> but like <laughs> a, a wise man of sorts kind of a mentor leading john uh down this path uh, and I always, like, I saw a bunch of people online like, I don't, maybe Father Garcia is a bad guy because in one ending he points a shotgun at John. But, like, if the entire town was being killed by, like, this demon cult that's trying to bring back the devil and one of the guys just decided to sleep in one day, I'd probably point a gun at him too. I'd be pretty <laughs> upset. <laughs> yeah, as far as Garcia is concerned, like, there's a war going on. Um, kind of like how I believe that... Um, you know the, the war in heaven you know and all that stuff it's still going on we just don't really see it um it's it's like the transformers you know like they're, <laughs> they're among they're, they live among us they're powerful beings from another world you know and some of them are here to help us and guide us and some of them are here to uh, enslave us and trick us you know because like megatron always wanted to make deals with like with like you know real estate tycoons and like you know stuff like that and be like I'll give you powerful technology if you help me. And they're like, all right, I'll help you. And then he's like, just kidding. You know, and it's like, oh man, there's some spiritual stuff there. I'm serious. I, I know, I know. It's like just so funny film. to consider like the, the continuous war of Armageddon to be like, it's I like found, Cybertron. <laughs> I found God. Yeah, Cybertron is the world, you know, that came before, you know, and, um, or the kingdom of God and stuff. And yeah, there, was, yeah. there, was a, there was a war in heaven and some were cast out and some were, are here to kind of guide us and, so I, I found God through Transformers, that's for sure. <laughs> and uh, I see Jesus in this Transformers film. Anyway, <laughs> so that's kind of the that's kind of the thing with Garcia. Um, I think he's a really interesting character, and um, a lot of people, a lot of people, a lot of players are asking for a sequel that's like John and Garcia, like on the road, like on the road, like investigating stuff. You know, doing, um, you know, basically like a big road trip across america like you know it's the film like the series supernatural except it's like with yeah. a grumpy old man and, and john yeah um and i would i would love to do that uh eventually I, I have a different idea for chapter four i would eventually like to do the 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 uh you know the lethal weapon films but starring john and and garcia you know i absolutely love that you mirrored the whole arnold's it's from predator right the arnold schwarzenegger hand clasp thing <laughs> i love yeah, so that you mirrored that, that with him that's so like good royalty free yeah that's just like royalty free stock footage that i use but yeah it's the same it's the same sentiment it's fantastic it's perfect to you is that the canon ending of chapter three well there's several you know um i wanted i don't consider running away with lisa uh, a bad ending because i think it would come naturally that or I think it would be a natural reaction for John to just be so exhausted. I mean, you saw him after Super Miriam, you know, he's covered in blood. He, he's been he through can a barely lot. barely catch his breath. Yeah, and he's, you know, amen could mean amen to my, my mission, you know, amen mm, to my that's, objective. That's true. I didn't think of it that way, but that's true. But it could be the start of something new. So I left it up to the player to be like, you know, bros before hoes or, um, <laughs> or, like, or like go with Lisa and try to live your life in peace. But mm. there's always a possibility that john's demons will come back to haunt him you know no matter who he he goes with you know the unspeakable yeah, is still out yeah. there and john never i don't think john ever encounters the unspeakable in chapter three he he does in like dream form in chapter two um yeah. so yeah he sees a there's the ending where he sees miriam become it and then when he's in the basement of the church that's right that's but right. yeah he never he sees it in chapter three him. yeah 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 so it's still out there and obviously it knows about John because it foiled the profane because he ruined the profane Sabbath and 
prevented uh prevented Gary from preparing the way for the Antichrist, like him and him and um him as Astaroth and Malthus, you know, as Malthus. And so um yeah, um there could be a lot of stuff, you know. Uh I don't know if I'm gonna make a full game of if John goes with Lisa, you know, boyfriend girlfriend duo. But um you know, um, I think the the Garcia, you know, maybe if there was a Garcia chapter five or whatever, if there was like a Garcia John thing, and then like at some point Lisa's in trouble and they got to go like get her, yeah, uh, yeah, or she joins, or maybe she's. Um, I always wanted to do like a. Um, I don't know if you've ever played like um, Smash TV or something like that, like a um, like a survival top down game where there's just like waves of enemies, like Serious Sam, but co op and 2D. right, right. Um, I wanted to do something like that where it was like local co-op so someone could play as Garcia if they wanted or someone could play as John. Oh, that's so cool. You know, or maybe there's a rabbi or maybe there's an imam, you know, or maybe there's like a Mormon dude. I don't know. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> just like have a cast of characters, um, you know. It's like they, Left 4 Dead, but you pick your religion. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, yeah. So it's like um, Gauntlet, you know, <laughs> but instead of classes, it's like, what church do you go to? Um so it's like i love i love watching paranormal videos on the internet from um from muslim countries because oh they're the scariest by far well yeah the the whole uh jinn um yeah yeah more and stuff but also so um not a stereotype but in the u.s like you know with like western like demon stuff if there's like demon caught on tv it's like really scary and everyone involved is really scared but like, nah, not these guys from like, not these guys from like Malaysia or the Philippines or whatever. Um, these like, like these like Muslim guys who like go like urban explore exploration and stuff and they see a demon, they like go at it. Like they, they, you know, they like go after it and they're like, Allahu Akbar, you know, and they're saying like, <laughs> you know, God is great. God is great. You know, that which comes from Allah will return to a lot, you know, they're citing scriptures and prayers and stuff. And they're just chasing after the demon. Like they, like they that's the kind of energy confidence. we need to bring to the table. Absolutely. Yeah. They have total confidence that they're going to banish this thing. And, and I love it. It is so wild. You know, I'm cheering for them. It's so great. <laughs> uh, it's totally a different vibe um, from, um, you know, from like, you know, just some, some YouTube channel is like, Oh, we, we, you know, we got tickled by, you know, we got our, our ribs tickled by a demon and it was so scary, you know. <laughs> you know, they're like screaming and like, dude, get out of here, get the F out of here. You know, but it's like, nah, dude, those those dudes from like Islamic countries are, just, you know, that neck of the woods, man. They, they're they they're out for blood, man. They're out to kick some butt. They're like the guy on, um, on freaking Dead Alive, the priest who's like, I kick ours for the Lord. <laughs> Like that's what they're I doing. Forgot about that. Yeah. Oh man, yeah, that's such totally... a great uh, uh, dualism to Garcia. <laughs> yeah, he's like that, but a little more like surly, you know. Yeah. Uh, but anyway, I you know I would love to explore. I would love to make a game about uh, Dibbucks or Jins or um, you know Hispanic or uh, you know Central American folklore or South American because I was uh, I lived very briefly in south america and then i i've been to mexico and i've been around um you know border mexico culture because i'm from the south and some of those stories man that they told me were just wild and i I would love to dive into that or do something with uh with islam how you know they have their own form of spiritual warfare and their own like rituals and ways of doing things you know but i'm you know i'm just a gringo you know from america so i i don't think i would have um I don't know. I don't think it'd be very authoritative. So I would have to team up with someone, you know, who yeah, it kind of yeah. knows that culture better than me. Um, but I, I would, I love to, I love to like read about and, and hear and, and listen to stuff like that. It's, it's fascinating to me. Yeah. I, but yeah. That's, I kind think of that's, a, that's kind of the, that's kind of the point of father Garcia, I guess. Cool. Cool. Yeah. Like, like I said, definitely the coolest character, I think just the idea of a priest with a shotgun. Like I was sold instantly like yeah, it's, it's just so cool part, and garcia didn't always wasn't always like that because in this game where he's like running around like gary gary silent hill like gary hill um in this like 3d uh survival horror game i was gonna make 
um there was going to be a part where he like walks into a, a, a like a warehouse and there's like a bunch of like military grade weaponry in there like um you know an m16 you know a belt of grenades and uh you know an rpg uh and stuff like that and about six six cases of ammunition and it says nothing useful after that you know <laughs> like the res- <laughs> it's like all garcia needs is the power of the lord but i i want him to kind of change his mind and be like hmm maybe maybe it would be good to shoot gary in the face you know <laughs> um maybe that would do something and uh maybe maybe there's a you know maybe maybe they got something going on here with this whole like shotgun thing <laughs> or be like supernatural where uh you find out that his shotgun has like uh vials of holy water or yeah, salt. yeah you know? they like put crosses on the front of the bullets or something like that yeah 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 i th- was was it is it constantine where he like engraves crosses that, yeah that's constantine like that? yeah i i love the keanu reeves constantine it's a cool movie it's a very I don't cool care. movie if it has nothing and that, that's a, it's a it's an excellent depiction of satan in film in my opinion uh it, he's he's chilling in that one um <laughs> and like i don't really like the whole like fallen archangel like defecting or whatever but like all the rules like you know i have to look at a you know cats are like halfway in the real world halfway out of the spirit world you know so if i put my feet in water and stare into to a cat i can stop time and go and visit hell Uh, And the way I get out of hell is I use the uh, holy hand grenade, you know, and splash it on me. And like, I have a, I don't know. I did he have like a crossbow or is that Van Helsing? I don't know. I'm getting it twisted. Yeah. Yeah. I, I love all the like gadgets he has and how there's some sort of explanation for it, you know? Yeah. And they, and they did something similar to supernatural, you know, they got like their salt rock shotguns and stuff like that. Yeah. 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 We just watched that episode. Um, my wife watched it when she was younger and i never watched it so now we're kind of watching it on Netflix oh cool cool for yeah. inspiration and stuff oh yeah and, it's uh, it's a perfect i've seen i think the first 10 seasons it's a great show a lot of fun there's a lot of content and it, it ran for a long time yeah and it, i'm um uh, i'm trying to get through buffy the vampire slayer but it's like slightly more cheesy than i i hate to say this but i you know, Supernatural is very cheesy, but it had that kind of early 2000s, like super edgy, like editing and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Vibe. of course. So, uh, yeah. And um, so I, I tried to get into Buffy, but I think I'll, uh, as much as I love Sarah Michelle Gellar, I think I'll save that for later. It's definitely yeah, made for a younger audience, I think. Very much enjoying. Uh, and then we, we watched Riverdale for a while. That is a, <laughs> that is a trippy <laughs> show. Like they jumped the shark in episode one and they just, they just it just keeps it going for, like, from there yeah it just keeps going it's crazy anyway um but yeah i like garcia as well um i like all the characters i wish i could have done more with lisa um but i would like to do more with her and explain more of her connection to john in the next installment i, cool. I think is cool. what i would like to do with that cool okay excellent um okay so you you brought up some stuff about like the cult of the second death and stuff like that of course the game is told out of order uh in in the sense that we, we kind of meet john in the middle of the action or at least while we may be at the beginning of john's story the cult has been around for a lot longer there's been a lot of setup to the events we see depicted and then there are things like uh episode two or chapter two i mean being like a dream sequence uh of for what i assume to be events that really happened uh except of course like what happens to john and them but the stuff about the church and the notes you find and stuff like those are all real it's just john experiencing them through a dream so with that yeah that's what i always maintained is it's it's real to john yes yeah that's the caveat there yeah like like he doesn't go through all that stuff but the notes you find and stuff like these are actual events the church actually went through this stuff like that um yeah i I think so yeah okay so with that in mind is the first like looking at it on a timeline chronologically is the first event that led to all of this sister bell giving into demonic influence yeah so sister bell's pretty much the originator of the cult of the second death um according to me uh she was the first person to successfully to discover the ritual and to successfully do it Okay. Um, and the other side gifted them Gary, who is a pre precursor to the Antichrist. Right. Well, he's a normal human, uh, just like you and me. He, oh, yeah, that's right. He's yeah. a normal human being, just like you and me. Don't worry. 
and um yeah so it it all pretty much it all pretty much um starts with her so you find out that gary is kind of the offspring of um miriam bell you know and uh yeah there's i'm you know the whole story of her showing up at the at the orphanage and you know implying that um she was one of the original you know children that got she was the one that was left you know that didn't get killed you know and something yeah happened yeah to you know she was shipped off somewhere and so we don't really um you know we don't really know what really happened to her so yeah right. she would be um and it's implied in chapter three you know gary says stare into the eyes of my mother and you see a portrait of her uh in her regular human form and then she kind of morphs into what she looks like in chapter two yeah yeah so did the, there was the events that happened before like the children who get taken like you said it's implied that miriam is one of the surviving children right yeah from like the first the very the first, first one. one like it was six kids right that went missing See, you're quizzing me on my old lore for something. That, I, th for something I think I did, it. Like, see, I'm, I'm four years ago, of, so. of course, of course. The only reason, like, I'm able to is because I, I got no my fans all the time. Oh, I, like, wait, I, I'm the same wait, way. Wasn't man. their name this or wasn't the date this? I was like, I'm like oh, pe people crap. will ask me about like videos I did, and I'm like, I did a video on that. <laughs> like, <laughs> I, I read their Yeah, yeah. But the, the, yeah, the only reason I'm cheating my... this much is because I got notes in front of me and stuff, and so I'm. No, I'm no, I got the notes it. here. I got the original text here. I got the oh, sacred Jedi. Text. Oh, you've got you've got the the Four text. Missing kids. Yeah, so I think I changed. I I think there was originally six. And I think yeah, four missing kids. Two kids left. Uh claim that the woman miriam bell isn't actually gone when i ask where she is they look at each other then back at me and tell me to ask her herself so those two kids are um i don't think i should tell anyone this but <laughs> those two kids are john and lisa in, mm. in that one so okay with the thing with father clark um let's see yeah so the, a guy comes to to investigate the missing kids right and at this point, uh, Belle has, like, she's now the sister at the church, right? Yeah, let's see. Yeah. Found these very good ones. Yeah, so Sister Belle was, let's see. Man, y'all are really making me go back here. Yeah, I don't I don't mean to catch you out on your front front no, no, stuff. No, no, I know no, how it goes. Um, two Nights of Whispering or something. Else. Okay, so there was something in the... Six graves. Oh yeah, so there's an unnamed priest who had all six of their group of or six of their orphans um taken away by the by the cornfield demon. Yeah, right. Right. Yeah. And um and then after that we have a new volunteer look after the children's sister Bell. She came highly recommended. Uh staffing the church after all these years been careful about letting out what happened to the children i'm the only one left who knows about it soon i'll be gone um yeah three next week and three sometimes so the, there's the number six again and then mm -hmm. chalice lore sister bell strange behavior you know, much besides seeing okay on mother found all six children staring yeah so um I forget. Maybe this... Oh, yeah. So I think there's actually more incidents. So this is like a cycle that happens at the church. So there was like the original incident where all six kids were dragged into the cornfield and killed um, by the cornfield demon. And then there was when Miriam Bell showed up, she took four kids with her and two were left. And then um, either the two that were left were John and Lisa or they were just two kids that kind of rep represent or are there to remind John of Nate and Jason yeah, and, or his duty to them. And then I think there might've been a third incident where they tried the orphanage one more time. And then the ghost or the sister, the spirit of sister bell or sister bell in her like more demonic form shows up um, and like torments them and tries to take them away. So I don't, uh, I don't really know how I want to do that, but yes, it's, it's, yeah, it's yeah. you can, the canon is that it's heavily implied that the two kids that were left were John and Lisa. John and Lisa, but yeah. But there might, there might be some, like, dates and stuff that kind of mess it up. 
Yeah, no, tell no. The, tell the fans I will to the faith fans I will make it make sense eventually. <laughs> <laughs> no, man, I don't. Games go through like you know adjustments and retcons and stuff like that all the time. I I, I don't think that's your discredit. There's so much lore to keep up with anyway. Yeah, I already had to change uh, John's very briefly married to wife uh, name from Karen to Molly because people are just making jokes about Karen. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I thought I was going crazy because I thought I remembered Karen. I'm like, oh no, her name's Molly. Okay, I guess I was wrong. So yeah, I'm, I changed I'm it. Not crazy. I okay, cool. Wanted to avoid the the stereotype or whatever. Understandably, understandably so. Okay, cool. So, um, yeah. And then, and then a lot of a lot of people are like, well, is John a real a real uh, priest or is he not? And um, I was having a conversation about like game stories with some writers for games for another project I'm working on and. Um, they were talking about a script that I was writing for them for a, a undisclosed project that will probably be announced in maybe next year, but um, it's a pretty cool one. And uh, they were like, well, it, you can't, you can't give the player this choice because then it's like you're changing their whole, whole personality or their whole history. I'm like, why not? You know, like, why can't I do that? <laughs> so we disagreed on that. I, I believe that it's fair when you have a narrative game to like, for like a, um, a choice that you make to change the ending and change the nature of the protagonist you're playing as like i think it's completely fine and, uh, and acceptable like there's a game called the suffering that was about um a guy on death row who is um accused of murdering his family and at the end of the game depending on your choices it's de it's decided that if you did all bad choices and it's like yes you did murder your family because you're just a sociopath you know or a psychopath and then the neutral ending is like you you killed your family, but it, you were like possessed to do it. So you weren't in control of yourself. And if you get the good ending, it's like you didn't kill your family. This mobster ordered a, a hit on your family mm. and you blame yourself because mm. you blacked out or something like that. So like I'm fine with that kind of narrative stuff. So there are decisions that the player can make that call into question whether or not John is a real priest. Um, but just because the Catholic church denies that John is an ordained minister doesn't mean he actually isn't, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I always envisioned own, it not to like have their own asses to save, you know? Yeah. Not to like sway audiences who may be listening to this and don't know, but my interpretation was always that he was up until the, the possess the Amy or, or first exorcism where he went to the psych ward for a while. I figured after that, they yeah, just yeah. denounced he was, him. He was dismissed. Yeah. He was yeah. dismissed from the, um, you know, from the seminary or whatever, um, at that point. And that's why he, he married, you know? Yeah. And he, yeah. Married very, he made, he married very quickly to like, um, to, um, distract himself from, you know, from the struggle with Amy and kind of put all that behind him. Yeah, but of course the dreams <laughs> came back and, and Molly left a note saying, I can't do this anymore, you know? And so, uh, that's kind of, that's kind of how that happens. So a lot of people are like, wait a second, how could he be, um, how could he be uh, a priest and be married? That's illegal, you know. Yeah, <laughs> highly irregular. <laughs> and uh, so uh, that's kind of the explanation I gave myself. Okay, cool, cool. Uh, to to wrap up about like the Miriam details. So canonically, the first event in like the cult of the second death and all that stuff, all the way back, was you said Miriam was one of the people who was attacked by the corn demon originally. So um, there was. Let's see. Or just a group of kids were kidnapped and then a Miriam group of shows kids up. Were killed and there was um let's see. Yeah, I will finish my gruesome work and then renounce the ministry. This is a guy that's burying the six kids that that they some of them they found their remains. I don't want to see anyone from the sanctuary ever again, not even that girl who stayed inside the house last night. Mm, um, so okay. that is implied to be Miriam. Th so I she see. Was yeah, yeah. She was she was chosen. So she was corrupted. She wasn't, she's not a demon and she isn't just a bad seed from birth, you know? And I don't know if I ever want to like get into her story. Uh, yeah, of whatever. course. But yeah, that's basically yeah. what happened is that she, she gave, she gave up her, um, you know, eternal destiny for the, the power to bring these demons into the world. You know, right. For and, some reason. And then from there, you know, she brings Gary yeah, into the Gary. world, the cult starts, all of that. So the inciting incident was, either her summoning or agreeing to go along with this corn demon that killed these people and then 
from there she becomes a sister in the seminary yeah, as a wolf in sheep's clothing demon, yeah i think she just kind of went off by herself or maybe the corn demon like followed her and you know infested and possessed her later on or something yeah, yeah. Or, or, it wasn't necessarily that she went off with the corn demon you know it was just, right right yeah corn demon was there to yeah yeah when i say went off i mean like she went on to become a sister become like a nun part of the church stuff like that yeah and um and she turns out to be like very creepy you know um so yeah that's kind of how it went and there are parts where where she kind of i think there are parts where she like stares off into the cornfield or like is dancing around near the cornfield with the kids and stuff and it's like weird weird stuff like that that the other people notice but yeah, she eventually discovers the rituals of the second death and what they can do. And she was the first person to, you know, who was a quote unquote worthy enough vessel to, um, to, to attempt it, you know? And, uh, and so she attempted it. And after, you know, many days of passing, you know, sacrifices through the portal to hell in her face, um, Gary came to out. Hell. <laughs> this is game so and, wild i love it yeah and they named him gary um and um so yeah so since so gary has been around for you know he's quite old even though he looks kind of like middle-aged or you know maybe in his 50s but miriam being mortal she would have died and her, her spirit went on you know to possess you know and haunt and stuff but she would eventually die and so gary would take up the reins um you know as a, as like a, a demonic force that could kind of like be the manager you know yeah and when they find her in the crucible you know the at the game's final fight she's j she looks to be just like a body hanging there yeah so her that's her corpse yeah 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 she, she her corpse is in the uh the honorary the honorary location of in in the mouth of baphomet himself you know yeah or yeah. at least the statue of it which is kind of a it's kind of like a Dante's Inferno thing where I think there were three three people specifically that he wrote were being had the uh, in the, had mouth the privilege of, of being chewed on chewed on by Lucifer for all eternity. Yeah. Yep. So I thought that was an interesting imagery. So yeah, having her hanging by your feet from the mouth of Baphomet. Ah, fascinating. Kind of, cool. Yeah, I see let, that. Let cool. Up, let me pull up the art for that room because it's it's really symbolic. So um, in uh, let's see. Yeah, Gary, Old Brutus, Cassius, and Judas. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's see. Um, oh yeah, ending two. Sorry. Um, yes. Yeah, so, um, yeah. On the left is this is the seal or symbol of Astaroth, and then there is a um, the symbols. I don't think have any any real meaning but the there's a figure a winged figure holding a crown and that's and holding a snake you don't see that i was going to have uh gary launch snakes at at john so thank you uh, you're welcome for not like making the boss fight even more harder <laughs> oh yes reign of spiders again <laughs> can't wait oh, yeah reign of spiders <laughs> i love that um and people love that so i i'm very happy to this day um, yeah, any stream a... i'm in where i die people say like any video game i was playing call of duty Every time oh, I yeah. die, they're like Mortis, Reign of Spiders. Every time, <laughs> yeah, and um, that's awesome. <laughs> and so Astroth is depicted as this like winged creature holding a crown and holding a snake, and Gary as as Astaroth is more of a bastardization of that, and that he has like little chicken legs cut Ooh. jutting out from him, and he like crawls on the ground. Um, he does not have a crown, and he does not shoot snakes, uh, thankfully. But then Malthus on the right is also a winged creature looking down um and is holding a spade because symbolically malthus holds a shovel or a spade yeah and um is also holding a crown so they share a crown as a prince of heaven to uh bring the antichrist interesting forward. cool yeah cool. so they have they're like partners and stuff so you know and gary just you know he wanted to wait till john showed up so he could show him how cool it was you know? <laughs> so is gary astaroth effectively yeah, Gary is a demon called Astaroth. Okay, yeah. okay. Gotcha. That's his true identity. Gotcha, gotcha. Because I remember Astaroth being mentioned in the game. I didn't connect that that is Gary. That is his identity. Yeah, yeah. And uh, let's see. 
let's see i have a room called gary encounter number 15 gary <laughs> encounter uh it has so this is a this is a, a room that is prepped for the second death that's why if you die in the gary fight if he catches you without your cross um john appears with the hole in his face and then a hand comes out and grabs the camera yeah. so the knife, ritual knife and the ritual mask are already there and the signs the inverted cross are already there um and it contains the imagery of the um of the um unholy trinity so the falling star is where gary is standing um and then the symbol of sacrifices going down into the um into the uh portal is down there and the chalice who is the um the daughter yeah the ch the filled chalice is the daughter who is also a mother mm. um and then the symbol on the right is the mother a uh, mother moon and then the spirit bird is on the very bottom and that's where john would john's feet would lay if they laid him down on that design to perform the second death mm. so like I was, I, was, I was extremely and then there's the as above so below um there's um a few kind of symbols of the feminine incorporated in there and then with the mother um let's see in the clinic the mother boss fight you have um cuneiform um a cuneiform symbol for mother and then the the inverted triangle with the line through it is pretty obvious like feminine anatomy symbol mm -hmm. um you know the birth canal you know the right, crucible right. and stuff so yeah i i tried to incorporate a lot of symbolism i'm sure they're like i'm sure they're like you know people who practice wicca and stuff that are like that's not how it goes but i'm like sorry I, I wasn't i'm not that into it you know, just <laughs> familiar aspects you know that's another question i had so like regarding demons like you know malthus you know i stuff like that and astaroth other than basically were these demons kind of like i just want to use names of actual demons depicted in the bible or were there specific or not in the Bible, and like, you know, mysticism and stuff like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, or was it, were there specific reasons why you pick these specific demons? Yeah, so as you get further along in chapter three, you start um, finding, like, the big names, you know? <laughs> like, Astaroth is a pretty well-known name for a, a demon. Yeah, he's up you there. You know, Malthus, not so much, and Alu, I just thought kind of sounded cool. Um, but yeah, I... Uh, I uh, wanted um, kind of big name demons to appear like towards the end, you know, in chapter three to where it's like the stakes are getting higher. Like these are actually, you know, these are celebrity demons. They're here, you know, Gary's like, everyone be on your best behavior. Alu is here, you know, and then there are unnamed <laughs> demons like the peak, like the peekaboo demon and the, uh, the mirror demon. Um, the mirror demon, I think is the only demon that appears in all three chapters um mm, yeah and um yeah i think that's it and um so they don't they don't really represent any like real ones um the big the big deep floating demon head um who is actually a manifestation of miriam bell um that kind of haunts you through gary land and and if he catches you if it catches you it throws you in the asylum and you have to do that little mini game yeah yeah they, they're not really connected to any actual demons but yeah i really wanted there to be like a connection to you know i i really wanted i wanted it to get serious you know towards the end so that's why there's like very overt uh symbolism you know and, and stuff like that cool cool okay yeah that that makes sense uh and i also like it it's always creepy to me you know as a christian seeing demonic names pop up in places that are real i'm like Ugh. <laughs> it always yeah, gives yeah, me a yeah. chill it works it works very well uh, okay, interesting. So, yeah, that answers that question. Another question I had going back to, like, the, the motivations, the uh, possessions to the demons and stuff like that, is something that is briefly mentioned in a note in Chapter 1. And okay. that is Nancy. So her name's Nancy, right? Amy's mom. Yeah, I always forget if it's Nancy or something else. Yeah, I think um, it's Nancy, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, because I think there was going to be Nancy, and then there was supposed I think at one point I randomly changed her name to another 
name and some fan was like wait what's her name and i was like uh um, maybe it was cindy cindy sounds familiar yeah hold which on, let me, let me do a amy, search for amy mom like, <laughs> whatever character that is oh no cindy is did i do that did it did you just discover like a inconsistency in <laughs> i um, didn't mean to i swear Okay, I officially changed her name from Nancy to Cindy. I'm sorry. Okay, all right. So, so her Cindy. Her officially Cindy. Okay, so Cindy. My apologies. You're fine. So Cindy has a note in chapter one where she talks about being suspicious of Amy's doll. Is, oh, yeah. Is that, is that like a clue to, towards a story element or is that kind of like the clown knows and that's something that didn't really pan out or what is the significance of that doll? That's just a red herring. Okay. Yeah. All it's, right. it's just a total red herring. Okay. Cool. But the the creepy thing about the doll is that it switches places. It it travels to the basement. Uh, yeah. Yeah. There's a random chance that it travels there. Um, but yeah, that was just to kind of show her ignorance of the situation because she's like, oh, Bob got it from the Middle East. I'll ask uh, whatever her name is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? And people are like, that's racist. And I'm like, well. Well, that's kind of the point. Know? Yeah. That's that's the joke. It's the 80s, like, suburban family. You know, it's the 80s, and this ignorant. woman's probably never been out of Connecticut, so... <laughs> she... Yeah, yeah, so I just want to... Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm fine if... I'm fine depicting, um, you know, the wrong kind of... Yeah, yeah, you, you can have bad kind of characters. Ideas. Yeah, of course. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, um, okay, all right. That's why Arrested that Development is so, is so entertaining. Oh, yeah, shows like that, shows like it's always we're like, sunny. like, glad I'm not those people. Yeah, <laughs> it's like, man, I'm glad I'm not there. <laughs> All right, cool. So there's that, and there's also the note from the missionary in chapter one, which you said, if I recall right, was not to be a stalker and go through like your tweets or anything. But I saw uh, you had a mention that that was based off a letter that you received as a missionary. Is that right? Yeah, no, it's something that I wrote. So oh, that you uh, wrote did, as a missionary. Okay. Yeah, so I did a mission trip in South America in the in Argentina around Buenos Aires uh, when I was a younger man is like seems like a lifetime ago um and a uh, beautiful country but i was in some pretty pretty kind of podunk kind of backwoods areas yeah. um and that is an actual experience that happened to us we um so they were there are worshipers of death there um in around around the u.s is called la santa muerte but uh argentine's have their own form of Spanish. So they say San La Muerte, which is not correct. And I've had people try to correct me on it. And I'm like, nope, that is what they call it. Like we use grammatically incorrect terminology all the time in the States. I don't know why you're anyway. <laughs> um, don't shoot the messenger. Um, but yeah, um, it was interesting. There were, there were folk saints. So it's majority Catholic, although uh, Pentecostal um, like Protestant and non-denominational churches are getting really popular in South America. Um, but the traditional, you know, religion that everybody practices is Catholic, right? Or they at least, you know, go for weddings, baptisms, uh, Christmas and Easter, you know, and it's like, whatever. Um, it's, a, it's a, it's very much ingrained in the culture, but, um, in the poorer communities, yeah. Or I guess, yeah. in the more like kind of rural out there kind of isolated communities, um, they worship San La Muerte. So you'll be walking through town and there'll be a little shrine with a little grim reaper inside. And, um, yeah, there are people who practice, uh, it's called Umbanda. I gave it a different name in, uh, in faith. I gave it a made up name just to kind of not associate it with a real, with the real practice. And, uh, you know, when I was a missionary, we talked a lot with them. We interfaced with them and interacted with them and they invited us into some of their shrines and stuff and kind of explained everything, um and stuff and so it's like santeria here in on like the west coast or um um you know a lot of um uh, a lot of a lot of gangs will you know like uh like ms13 types will kind of fall into this kind of like folk worship um i'm not saying the folk worship is in itself evil but like you right, know, you're right. more yeah of course. Uh, you're more edge you're more edge case people in society uh you know and um uh, uh so yeah i um i don't know much about it so i don't claim to be an expert you know i'm sure there's people there's people who practice it out there that would love to correct me and you know i i'm sorry if i'm being showing my ignorance but yeah um 
it was really popular in this town that we were in and uh, we found a found a kid who was really young and the story he tells to he told to Layton that Layton related to Amy about um them praying to a figure of San La Muerte and objects in the house moving around um and him getting really scared uh that is an actual story that a young man told to me happened that happened and um I was pretty floored by it that you know of and course, you never know yeah. if it's sincere or not we got called in to do an exorcism when i was a missionary wow uh, some people came out of a it wasn't official it, it's not what you think uh, but some people <laughs> it has um, not been approved by the vatican <laughs> it was definitely not well again i'm not catholic so yeah, yeah. you know and um I'm I'm more of a fan of the guys that like hang out outside the library and they're like, you look down, do you need a blessing? And I'm like, sure, you know, and they put their hand on you and pray over you. Like, I, I like that kind of stuff. I don't I don't think there needs to be paperwork with, you know, stuff like that. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, some people run out of a house or out of, of an apartment or something or a building. They're like, like, hey, hey, uh, hey, priests, uh, we need an exorcism in here. I was like, oh, really? And they're like, yeah, man. <laughs> they're like. I'm like, all right, we got Beavis and Butthead here, like trying to get me to come in here. And so I was with another guy and he was pretty big. So I was like, eh, we can take him if, if things get ugly. So we walked in and there's a guy like who was just drunk, you know, <laughs> but he was <laughs> speaking in Hebrew, you know, that you probably just found on the Internet or found on a, in a movie. And they're like, yeah, he's right in there, man. He's got a demon. And I was like, I'm not doing this, y'all. Like I, I like they, they were like cracking up. And I was like, all right. Ha ha, sober, very up, funny. sober up sober up guys and if this is still happening like um you know call us in the morning or whatever but <laughs> but yeah um that is an actual story so Leighton would be a stand-in for for me and that is not word for word but it's a, basically a page out of my journal when i was down there wow really crazy really crazy stuff i didn't i didn't experience anything supernatural down there but that was like one of the scariest things that anyone told me while i was do doing my work down there absolutely so what was the inclusion of it in the game kind of just another core element a part of world building yeah it's just to kind of generate that paranoia and that sense of isolationism you know and maybe a little bit of a red herring i d i don't mean to imply to anyone who practices santeria or whatever you know i i'm not the judge you know Right, and I don't. Of I, don't claim, I don't claim to have the authority to judge, so um, it's just a creepy thing that is something that I experienced in South America that um, you know I found out was actually kind of prevalent in the eighties. You know, there was like there was like this cult that was kind of along that lines that like there was like a massacre down in Mexico or something like that. I forget what it was called. Um, you know, and there was an there were a few ritualistic murders. Uh, I think on the West Coast during that time um that seemed kind of along those lines along that kind of um you know that kind of more edge case kind of um, folk religion and so i i kind of included it just to do world building like you said cool cool okay very fascinating i think that's super cool all right so uh we've got that uh another aspect of like the demonic influence in the area and stuff like that Something I wanted to ask about was we have the call to the second death who uh, they haven't taken over everyone in the town. Like we see police officers, we see neighbors through the window who haven't been taken over, stuff like that. At least not, you know, before the profane not, Sabbath. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, not, not, at least as long as you don't go to the bad ending, they're, they're fine. I, they don't seem to part I, of it. I'm really happy that I included that. So, um, if you go to day two and you, and you go to the kid's house where he's watching TV, um, He's watching a tiny rotoscoped uh, version of uh, WrestleMania between Hulk Hogan and Andre the Giant. <laughs> and that is, and th what he's watching is the moment when Hulk Hogan recovered and pile drived uh, Andre the Giant into the into the map. <laughs> that's what that's what that is. And then day one, I think it's a, a clip from um, Twenty One Jump Street. The original <laughs> That's hilarious. That's very the original funny. 80s series. Yes, yeah, so that's yeah. where I got it from. Cool, um, at cool. one point, I had I had a sped up version of um, a sped up the entirety of the movie Morbius, <laughs> but sped up. <laughs> but, and that was playing on the TV, and it was like you had to really, really be into Morbius memes 
to like recognize it. But what was when I told yeah. that to Dave, when I told that to Dave, he was like, "Nah, take that out. That's gonna be a stale meme in like a month." <laughs> and I'm glad I did. <laughs> but, uh, I can't remember if it's still in the game files. And but yeah, I, that was originally what was gonna be on the TV. That's hilarious. That is so funny. Okay, yeah, so so they haven't. They haven't taken over the whole the whole. Town. Yeah, they haven't taken over the whole town, but we do see they do have a lot of influence. Like when you're outside of the clinic. Uh, one will drive by every now and then uh, in like the oh, prologue. Yeah. They're, watching, to... they're following John around. Yeah, they're following them around. They, of course, Gary has his ties in the local clinic and uh, groups at the school, stuff like that. So, you yeah, know, they have a prominent member of the community. Exactly. Like they have a lot of prominence. There's a lot of this unseen kind of shadow figure um, politics that they have. Uh, however, my question is, is their plan effectively to outrun the police because while there are a lot of them they seem of course you know cult members whose ultimate goal is to have their face cut open and baby shoved through it obviously aren't in the best state of self-preservation um yeah. many try few succeed yeah, yeah right. <laughs> right so like i understand they don't care about their own individual safety but is their plan kind of to just get the profane Sabbath and for the Antichrist to come quickly? Because they're doing stuff like massacres at school and like th there's the demon, the peekaboo demon in the, t in the candy tunnel who kills all the cops. Like people are starting to catch wind of the cult and wanting to do something about it. Um, so effectively, is their plan to just outrun the cops or get everything done before they get caught? Yeah, well, the the it, it was the candy store killer who killed took a bunch of cops with them um, during the shootout. But yeah, there's also something else right, right. in there. Yeah, uh, which I think the cop there's one cop who like said that he saw it or something like that, and that's why he has that like highly cynical note about like. Good. You know, I hope it kills more of them. Yeah, that whole. Thing. Yeah, I hope it kills more of the the hoodlums and stuff, and and uh, you know, and the the degenerates that he identifies. You know, and um, so uh yeah um i haven't really thought that out you know like wouldn't there be like an fbi investigation into this <laughs> um there was an fbi in investigation into groups like the searchers and stuff um yeah and if you've ever if you've ever looked into that then um when during the camera sequence in chapter two in the apartments you should um leave john in the dark and uh turn your headphones up and wait like a minute and you'll get some cool easter eggs about the searchers and, really uh, yeah, I didn't know a, this. Not a lot of people know about that. I did, hold on. I am writing that down. <laughs> I, I am not letting that one slip me by. So during the sequence, yeah, so in, in when, the demo, you, when you have the camera, if, right. yeah, if you don't do the camera flash and just leave John in the dark in the silence for like a minute or two, you'll you'll get an Easter egg if you turn your. And it's All not right. a, it's not a jump scare, or ear rape or anything. I'm in immediately the de doing in that. the demo. In the demo, it was me whispering in your in the in your headphones, going, "Hey." You know, um, and then the other one, it was just like a Paul stretched kind of spooky noise or whatever. But uh, so, so yeah, chapter some... three, day two, right in the apartments. Yeah, just go to the okay. apartments, get the camera and just don't do anything and just turn up your headphones. A lot of people don't know about that. Well, guess um, guess what? <laughs> guess what I'm going to yeah, do? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, my goal was to catch people who were like just had the game playing in the background and just had it kind of like, you know, on the side and they were like doing something else like checking their email and then they they start hearing these easter eggs and stuff so yeah um yeah i i did it's just you got to kind of suspend your disbelief that like the people of connecticut are so dumb that they can't catch on to like an impar entire apartment complex taken over by a cult and like oh of course all these demons course. running around and yeah, I, I, I think really it makes sense full, the way it is. I don't really have a full idea of what the profane Sabbath is supposed to be. I think it's just a ritual that's just kind of supposed to prepare um, the way for the Antichrist. So some sort yeah, of mass yeah. sacrifice or whatever, or maybe a resurrection of Miriam um, into, you know, the which is what you see in the final, final boss. Right. Or something like that. Um you know maybe it maybe there is another crucible that needs to you know because since amy was unavailable to gary starting in chapter one um he needed a new vessel and he probably thought it was poetic to use john as the new vessel uh, because he screwed up his plans with amy you know to use her um so that's kind of what that was all about um i don't want to think about what it would look like if the antichrist got summoned by gary you know if he was successful in that maybe Maybe in a later installment, we'll we'll go into that. 
Yeah. Okay. Fascinating. Um, I really just have one more question about the story itself. Something I kind of yeah, wanted yeah. to hear your opinion or clarification on. Because a lot of it, like I had stuff written down to ask about like the being of light or, you know, Michael and stuff. But we kind of, you covered all that in just our general conversation. So the mm. last thing I really wanted to ask about was uh, in chapter one, we find the note in the mirror demon fight that talks about John being in the psych ward. And then, like yeah. you said, in chapter three, whenever the giant floating head attacks us, we're back in the psych ward and we see letters yeah. saying that John got released and all that. Yet During that time, we see, you know, John was arrested after everything that happened at Amy's house after the initial exorcism. So he goes to a psych ward for a while. And there is the one letter where he says, I can't remember if he says it or if a doctor says it about him, that he, no, I believe John says it, that he understands that what he saw was not religious or supernatural and it was all just <laughs> him making it up, right? Is that John seriously doubting his faith or is that just what he's saying to get out of the psych ward? Well, I'll give you a clue. So um, Gary speaks very properly he doesn't use contractions like don't and can't he says do not and cannot so um contrast how he speaks with the the way that note is written and you'll you'll know who actually wrote that note i never remotely considered that wow yeah that it's it's not john who wrote that it was someone who was trying wow. to get him it was someone who was trying to get him out in the open wow yo <laughs> <laughs> or it was or it was someone who was influencing John, you know, yo uh, or possessing him to write that. Bro. Or maybe it's something that John felt like he had to he had to write to get out of there because he was still tormented by Amy, you know. He was in the asylum, she was there with him. Yeah, yeah. You know. And I want to explore that in a later episode, you know, explore his time in the asylum, but um but yeah, um it's it's not actually john who wrote that it was someone who was Dude. trying to okay so hold on that that makes me ask another question then um what would gary or the cult or what have you why would they want john out why would they want him what uh, sorry i out. think he cut off or something oh sorry why, why, why would... <laughs> i thought you just had a really dramatic pause <laughs> <laughs> yeah keeping you on pins and needles yeah yeah um, um, why, why would you want him out because yes. um i think at that point uh i don't know maybe they wanted john in their pocket as like a potential victim or something like that or um you know maybe gary saw that john was someone with tremendous potential for good or evil you know like all of us and yeah, uh yeah. wanted him where he could easily snatch him up or watch him and or something like that. I haven't really. That does all line out, up. Yeah, that, that does that line particular up. particular note is not. Uh, Man, I'm so glad you said that. I never would have even, I would have just been in my video like, Oh, well, John was saying this to get out of the asylum, but man, that's so much cooler. That's so much cooler. That. Gary yeah. I think, was I think he was, e I think he was either influenced or, um, or someone else, someone else wrote it. That's so cool. Of course, of course, there's a version of the story where Gary actually runs the asylum and he uses it to do creepy experiments and and more sacrifices. But um, I don't know. I don't know how I'm going to do all that. Um, but yeah, um, yeah. That that note is is sus for a reason. Cool. Perfect. I'm so glad you said that, man. All right. That's dope. Uh, <laughs> uh, I'll I'll ask generally. So you said there was stuff like the uh the the finders uh easter egg if you sit in the dark for too long and st like what you just said about the um how that note's actually written by gary is there any other things you can think of or are willing to tell us about either an easter egg not a lot of people have seen or a lore point not a lot of people have picked up on anything you think we're missing well i'm disappointed that there aren't many van halen fans who have uh played <laughs> faith because in chapter two there's a there's a literal there's li literal van halen lyrics in a note man i i'm sorry to disappoint you i never picked up on that there's also a um there's also a blatant undertale reference um, oh where, where's the undertale reference it's a part where he says i i called help from i called help from the others but nobody came it's a mm. it's a um reference to um you know you 
you call out for help, but nobody came or something I like see, that. I when see. I see. Gotcha. So if you kill if you kill enough people and then fight Flowey uh, during the genocide run, I think it'll be like you you it, it'll give you that message. I see. Gotcha. Um, what else? What else? Uh, something that people haven't picked up on that I I don't know. We've had so many revelations in this call. Um, <laughs> we sure have. What else? What else? What else? Um. I don't know. Every every now and then, um, oh, um, this is something that people are usually really um, people are usually really like excited to. Um, that was weird. Um, excited to hear about is that um, there are there is recorded audio from an actual recorded exorcism and documented exorcism interwoven through the. Um, through the sound design of chapter two and chapters two and three. Ooh. Oh, that's terrifying. Yeah. So it's, it's a bit crunched, um, bit crunched sound bites from tapes from an actual exorcism, uh, a fairly famous one. Some people will probably guess what it, what it is. But uh, I would guess just out of respect for the people involved. I, I, Okay, I, I, I will. I will mention exactly it. Then. I, I will you mention can probably it then. You, you can probably guess. I'm pr- as it's someone true. who like dabbles in exorcist stuff and all that, uh, yeah, yeah. I I, th- I think I can guess, but I'll leave it at that. Yeah, go out on the weekend, expel a few demons. Yeah, you know, I dabble. It's, it's fun. You know, bring the kids. Cool, <laughs> bring the kids. Yeah. <laughs> um. Yeah. Uh, what else? What else? Oh. Um. One of the music tracks was created by taking a song from um, Kirby's Adventure for the Nintendo, uh, for the NES, and just like speeding it up really fast. Because <laughs> I think Kirby music is like really, it's like it's like cocaine music, like it's like extremely <laughs> fast and like bippity boppity. So I like I don't know, I just like sped it up real fast, and I think I made it like backwards and sped up real fast. So hopefully, it's not I don't get sued by Nintendo. It's not that one. Oh, uh, there's one that creeps me out every time I hear it. It like stains the hairs on my neck up. Um, what? It's during a boss fight, I think. It's it sounds like garbled static getting. It's like a palindrome noise. Like I'm doing a horrible impression. What? What? Uh. Oh man, where is that? I, yeah, it's not in, it's not in the boss music. It's it's from okay. a very specific cutscene um, that you know um, it's during the Michael death screen. So it's like when he catches you, you get you see him crawling gotcha. for like a split second, and then he dies. So that's that's what I did there. <laughs> that's that's and then uh, <laughs> the the crazy bus theme song is used uh, for like when Amy like jump scares you, and it does like a <laughs> like kind of noise. <laughs> That's the crazy <laughs> song. Like, up. That's so funny. Yeah, I mean, I have to put it in there. It is so horrifying. Oh boy, it is such a horrifying piece of media. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, the the boss music. I I am really, I'm proud of myself with the boss music. A lot of that stuff was like I re, I made samples in in chip tone, um, which is a very old or it's not a very old but it's like a, a very easy to use i've been around for a while kind of like a digital synthesizer that you can use to make little 8-bit samples um and then a lot of stuff especially in chapter three i composed myself um in like a online midi sequencer and then i ran it through a chip tone a, like a 8-bit like chip tune um uh which i'm gonna call it like a sound font and then i compiled everything in or i arranged everything in audacity so nothing real nothing real uh fancy but i got really fancy with uh, the miriam super miriam theme song in that um i listened to like the doom eternal soundtrack and i listened to a bunch of andrew holschultz stuff and um i basically made an atari death metal song um that people seem to really like there's been like actual metal covers of that song like yeah that that like music goes hard and... <laughs> it goes very hard yeah so a lot of that stuff i just kind of composed myself the music that plays when you're fighting astaroth and then it's the music changes when malthus shows up that was meant to be an organ piece that i was right trying to write uh, but there's no like there's no like good sounding 8-bit organ mm. sound effects you know so um 
but yeah um yeah the, i i am not a i don't think i'm a very good music composer but i love creating music like i i think it's really fun to do especially when it finally comes together but man i do not know anything about music theory like the only music theory i ever i ever got was like one video some guy made on youtube about um why music in majora's mask sounds so creepy you know yeah so yeah. i have like two tricks up my sleeve so basically what i do is i just listen to a bunch of um i listen to a bunch of um music that i think could be um that i think could be a good in influence for this so for example the kind of like slow steady kind of industrial brooding music in gary land is uh was inspired by quakes quake 60 or no doom 64 um so i listened to the i put on the uh you know i put on the doom 64 soundtrack listened to all like all four hours of it and i was like okay i think i finally have a good idea of how i want to do this and then um i listened to a lot of music from silent hills one through four for the music in chapter three um i composed like i think 30 tracks or 20 20 or 30 tracks myself for chapter Dang. three and then the rest of um you know our little like stinger motifs and stuff and then the rest was just um you know like royalty free or um you know licensed like attribution licensed um classical music midi files that i just kind of slowed down and turned into 8-bit you know chip tunes kind of stuff wow I feel like, I like it. you're, I, saying I like you're not a good cameraman. Like you're just, <laughs> you may not feel that way, but you do great work with the material. No, 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 no. Like, like, I mean, contrast my music with like what Toby Fox did for Undertale. And it's like, man, you know, I could never be a virtuoso like him, you know, or uh, Hakita is making Ultra Kill and like does his own music and stuff. Or Andrew Holschel, you know. Um, I don't, I don't know, man. That, that Tiffany Boss fight talented. music goes pretty hard. That is, that is almost a uh, it's, it's almost a one for one recreation of the final boss fight in Silent Hill One, mm. where you fight the the like Baphomet kind of god that they summon. Yeah, because there's it's basically just like a pot banging against the microphone <laughs> like really <laughs> rapidly. You know? But yeah, that that kind of stuff. I and then there's part of the song that I I call the um, the eight eight bit uh, cat in heat part where it's like. <laughs> <laughs> no, then it starts with a da, 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 you know. Um, I should do like a beatbox version of the face soundtrack and make that like an option. <laughs> That's the, some guy, in the some guy in the background is like da 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 da. da. <laughs> but I, I love Moonlight Sonata uh, ever since I heard it in Resident Evil One, so I knew I had to like put that in. Uh, There's another game I really like called Shadow Man that prominently features that game that that sound uh or that uh song or that piece i suppose um so yeah um i don't know again like i don't i don't think i'm like a master programmer or a master like game designer like i'm still learning but some things really came together and having new blood there to like go over stuff and give me suggestions because you know there's all sorts of people that's working at at new blood like people who do audio people who do music uh people who do like level design and boss design so i was getting I was getting tips by the creator of Undertale on how to design, you know, a boss, you know, that was really helpful for me, especially towards the end when the bosses get like really hard and really fast. Yeah. So the guy who created, you know, Gabriel and, um, you know, the other iconic bosses and, and antagonists from Ultra Kill was, you know, was helping me with that. You know, the guys who made the level design for a medieval, which I think it has incredible level design were helping were giving me advice on uh making the levels and uh, you know how to sequence things in order and you know the guy who made dusk you know and like squirrel stapler and pony factory you know was helping me giving me suggestions on stuff that would be really creepy to include and uh, there's actually a monster from dusk i mean jacob from dusk appears in chapter three in a in a photograph and then and like gary writes a letter to him it's in a secret kind of a secret spot yeah and then after cabin. you exit after you exit the cabin one of the monsters from dusk jumps you you know yeah yeah because jacob sent it to gary as like a <laughs> present and, and gary says something like oh i'll keep it'll be a good guard dog or something like that 
Yeah, and I love Gary in that he's like, yeah, I don't have time for all that stuff you're doing, Jacob. Like, you should come over to my side, you know, then we can be equal, you know, then we can be peers, you know, but not equals, you know? <laughs> um, so I, I, I like how, uh, you know, Dave Oshry declared years ago that the New Blood games are all in the same universe, you know, however wacky that universe is, so. <laughs> I like that. Um, yeah, and then there's a third character that is yet to be revealed in another game that New Blood is working on um in mm. that in that photo or that polaroid or whatever. oh okay okay cool cool yeah yeah so i got permission from them to put one of the antagonists in that in that photo sick they're kind of a cult sick. they're kind of a cult leader themselves I, I did want to bring up when you were talking about uh like gave you ideas for the cult one of the most impactful things from the games and i think one of the reasons the horror of it has stuck with me so long because you know i consume so much horror media for this yeah, yeah. channel and just for fun like not a lot scares me anymore but okay. the process hardcore man oh my gosh dude the process of the second death ritual i have not quit thinking about since i played the game it is one of the most brutal descriptions or just brutal things in general i've seen in media where did that idea come from Yeah, well, uh, you know, <laughs> just from my kind of effed up imagination, I guess. Um, you know, I, I, um, I wanted it to kind of, you know, people who were, um, you know, kind of familiar with like child sacrifice and stuff, and like the whole Moloch stuff. Like, there's a part where you symbolically make sacrifices to Moloch in order to access the deeper areas of the second you know second death cold so yeah yeah um yeah anyway uh yeah the whole second death ritual just kind of um oh now i remember yeah it was it was sort of inspired by um the rope ritual in fatal frame 2 in that uh they talk about the ritual in notes but they censor parts of it because they're too sacred to to mention um, that's why there's asterisks in in the if you if you collect all the notes in chapter one, there's a secret note that shows up and it explains the second death ritual. Right. But it censors everything with asterisks, and yeah. that's that's directly from Fatal Frame Two, which is, in my opinion, a, a masterclass in survival horror design. Mm -hmm. And okay. um. And so yeah, it was like part of that kind of like. Some of that like J horror stuff, you know. But I, um, I thought like you know what is what is that hand and where is it coming out you know what where does it lead to you know if you stuck your hand in the hole in their face where would your hand go you know, and um, so um, yeah the I, the idea just kind of came to me that it's a portal in and out of hell, and it's like well what's the only thing that could fit in there you know well <laughs> <laughs> babies <laughs> babies and um. So yeah, that that kind of it kind of all started falling together and stuff. It's not it's not really related to anything that I've researched or anything. It's just completely made up, and it's it's very disturbing. And so I think I insanely I, think I hit a good chord. I think I struck a good chord, you know. With yeah, I I think it was incredibly effective. I think about it a lot. It's also such a it's not only terrifying body horror, obviously, like the face being cut up, yeah, but it's yeah. like a horrifying spatial like lovecraftian horror almost the idea that yeah just behind the face is a portal that can be reached into and things can crawl out of yeah and that's kind of um uh, it's that riddle that gary gives you about making a portal to hell sometimes it walks right up to you you know yeah. <laughs> and, so, and you know this we we're talking on the on the topic of spiritual warfare and like the war in heaven how it's still kind of raging on you know armageddon and stuff um you know, we we ourselves are are vessels. You know, we can we can cleanse the inward vessel and become a vessel for the Holy Spirit and God's love and um, you know His grace. Um, or we can be a filthy vessel that is home to uh, a, a different kind of spirit. And so, in a sense, we become portals. Uh, you know, to that to that world of spirits, whether they're good or evil. That's kind of what I believe. Huh. You know, we 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 are houses for our spirits, and then we pick up companions on the way, whether it's the Holy Spirit or whether it's something, you know, D other than that. I and um, so having the metaphor of 
people being portals to hell, not like something that, you know, like doom that someone built, you know, by mistake or something, you know, like a hole in the ground in, in, in some dark basement somewhere, you know, just the fact that people can be that connection to either d the divine or the satanic, um, I think was really important for me to, to dem to like illustrate. So that's, that's a big, a big reason for all that. I have never pieced that together. The idea that the second death ritual is kind of a physical manifestation of a lot of like what the Bible talks about, right? Like, you, there is demonic and th there's evil and good forces within the world who, who we choose to follow dictates what we become and the second death ritual is kind of like a a very brutal but like literal manifestation of that did you name it the second death ritual based on like bible verses that relate to like this is the second death yeah spiritual death you know the death of the of the spirit oh in that, that's so good <laughs> you know and damnation being a rejection of life that you know a conscientious and purposeful rejection of the of of life that you know, christ is the life you know in his his water you know we never thirst you know what he can offer us so yeah, yeah it is um the scary part is that so amy was not complicit in it she was a victim she's definitely a victim that, that may be that may be why um she didn't quite work out as the second as the um the new vessel for either the antichrist or something now tiffany she willingly either did it herself you know carved the hole out herself wearing them using the mask as you know a, a tracing guide yeah um or she got her she got some cohorts you know some peers to do that to, to cover her. up yeah but she willingly um did it and she f she falsely claims that she's the first to perform the ritual willingly the first one to actually do it willingly was miriam bell so mm -hmm. tiffany was actually really dangerous in what she was doing like um but there was kind of an ego clash between gary who was you know infatuated with amy and was obsessed with be her being the vessel you know and being his and claiming her soul whereas uh tiffany was kind of cast by the wayside as just you know a whatever to him and uh, in her rage, she she actually inadvertently did what Miriam did to start this entire process. So what she was doing was actually really dangerous. And, and that's why the demon is so dangerous. That's why when you finally kill that demon, there's like 400, there's exactly 490 of those little spirits that come out of it. Because oh, those are the, wow. those are the spirit. Yeah, there's exactly 490. I don't know if people realize. I that. never noticed that. Yeah, wow. well, I don't blame you for not counting. <laughs> well, sure, sure, but man, that is so terrifying. All of the when it's bouncing, spirits. When it's, when it's bouncing around the room, yeah. you know, going yeah, in going, between uh, faces. Mode. I always thought that was like smoke coming off of it. That makes so much no, sense. No, those are the little, the little shadow spirits that oh, come out of boy. like objects that you cleanse. And then there's <sighs> a, a huge eruption of them at the very end that finishes up the count of 490 so that's literally 70 times seven so that's oh. she 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 committed a very heinous act and she did it willingly oh bro uh, <laughs> so that's that's why i think tiffany's kind of like a unsung like crazy care like really crazy and interesting character you know and maybe she'll be in that game that i wanted to make i, I thought i thought she was down. a great antagonist i really liked her yeah she's psychotic she's, yeah uh, she's insane She's, and, um, you know, in a way, she's kind of what the stereotypical move would be to take for Gary. Like, crazy cult leader just wants to kill stuff. It's like, Gary's not that. But Tiffany, however... Oh, Gary's following the rules. He's doing exactly... He is following the rules of exactly what his mission is. And Tiffany just kind of goes rogue. And I think what she created, you know, what, what erupts out of her and kind of takes over her body is something that maybe even Gary, you know, wasn't prepared for, you know? Yeah, so that's that's yeah. the implication with her like like it's really serious with her um so anyway and so she takes upon herself the role of daughter in the unholy trinity uh, which is why she says she's the daughter of the unspeakable uh, you know and and maybe she maybe she really was maybe gary you know his pride got in the way and he didn't realize it so it it, it kind of goes kind of deep but um anyway i really love how you defeat her and then you see her body and then you try to leave the room and her body gets up and crawls after yeah, you like one yeah. Last... yeah it's really funny that's such a good effect. 
Yeah, little little spiders everywhere. She's actually the sprite for the reign of spiders. They're just grayed out. You know? <laughs> you gotta re reuse assets where you can, you know. The original spider. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yeah, so like, you know, it's pretty pretty crazy. I, I put a lot of thought into into the game, and I'm it's been really great, kind of geeking out about it over over it with you. Um, I will I can safely say this is going to be a very like there's going to be no other interview like this out of all the faith interviews I've done because you've just asked completely different questions and and had a completely new kind of perspective on it and I really appreciate that. It's well good fun. well good man. I am very happy to hear that. Uh like I said I'm a huge fan of the game. I love like the heart it came from all that stuff. Uh and it makes it makes me very happy that you're able to answer them. And I know like I've done a lot of interviews and stuff like that and I know it it's kind of easy to get asked the same questions over and over. Uh, but I wanted I wanted to spice it up a bit, so I appreciate that. I'm glad that you. I appreciate the spice. It. Yeah, <laughs> that means a lot, my man. Oh yeah, I mean every interview I go to, they ask the same thing, like what was the inspiration behind faith, and every time I'm happy to to tell them, you know. But I especially like this interview because I, uh, you know, coming from a a Christian you know background, both of us, I th I think we were able to kind of discuss the game on a level that uh, I, you know, I can't get that level of interaction, you know, in other places. Yeah, yeah. And like it it means a lot to me to confirm that my ideas about the game being about like actual faith or roots in Christianity isn't just me superimposing it on there. Like it was built with that in mind. And that as a Christian content creator who loves horror, that's really cool to hear. Yeah, you know, some of the some of the most effective Con, you know some of the biggest names in horror right now are practicing christians you know scott Cawthon is christian yep. he got to start making kind of cheesy kind of bible adventure games you know that's why people were like hey you know those characters would be really creepy in a horror game <laughs> you know and then the guy who made uh baldy's basics is uh is christian and uh there's um the guy who made um what's his name dropsy um dropsy is not a horror game per se but it has horror elements and that is actually a really good metaphor for the spiritual and mm. like our divine kind of destiny that we're like you know um we're just visitors here we we come from somewhere else you know mm. and um that is a really good game for that kind of along those lines and and uh, that that creator is a christian um david Szymanski's uh a believer so is john there's like a third Szymanski brother. I don't know how many there are, but there's a third one that makes games that I've never heard of his games, but I, I must, I could, you could probably make that assumption. So I don't know. It's, there's something about, you know, like zombies don't really scare me. Werewolves don't scare me. Mm -hmm. Blood and gore doesn't scare me. Um, you know, but like s stuff from the unseen world, mm -hmm. you know, spirits and, and demons and, uh, you know, unexplained things that kind of, defy the rules that we think this world is governed by that's the stuff that i really i really like i like a good old-fashioned ghost story um there was a uh, a film i watched on amazon prime it was called the the hope hopewell haunting hopewell haunting. And yeah so if you have a if you have a prime account you can you can uh or it's on like voodoo and google play and youtube and stuff it's like 3.99 and um, it is a slow burn, but it is one of the f coolest just ghost stories I've ever seen uh, in film. And it got it got low ratings and stuff, but it had some genuine, genuinely frightening moments and really, really good makeup. Um, mm. So, yeah, Hopewell Haunting, I highly recommend that. Um, Caveat, that's on Shudder. Um, that was my favorite horror movie of... 2019 mm -hmm. um you know stuff like that just real real simple stuff yeah yeah i gotta anyway, add, th this isn't related that's the kind of stuff that affects me you know yeah yeah i, I wanted to ask uh this isn't related to anything but just because you got me thinking about it are there any non well i don't want to say non-christian non-explicitly christian portrayals in media either books movies tv whatever any portrayals of angels, demons, Christianity, you know, religion in general that you find interesting? Like things like Passion of the Christ or whatever don't count because that's explicitly just, you know, Jesus. Yeah. 
they had a weird Satan. I don't know why I'm always like, ah, oh, that's a good Satan, you know. Uh, but <laughs> that was that was a weird one. Um, yeah. Well, um, this might not completely answer your question, but um, uh, the film Children of Men is a really interesting. Oh man, that's a great movie. Metaphor for uh, for not religion, but um there's a reason why the main character is named theo yeah you know theo having a latin root in in the word in a word for god so and and you see throughout the film the the symbology like every animal in the film like every dog every vicious attack dog in at those compounds that he visits and in that ghetto that he visits love him but they bark at everyone else yeah you know and so he has a spark of the divine in him and he acts as a savior uh, and he sacrifices himself in the end. To, sorry, spoilers to save um, this symbolic immaculate conception, you know? Yeah. yeah. Um, which isn't actually like she jokes about it, but it isn't actually, but it's like a symbol for that. Right. Right. That's and definitely so I, the theme the film's going with. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thought that it was a really interesting kind of take on, on kind of a, a savior, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That and, makes sense. Uh, what else? What else in horror? uh the not the conjuring the um hereditary was yes a my man absolutely horrifying absolutely horrifying film like that is probably uh my favorite horror film is the ring the the remake i'm 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 a filthy american remake gay <laughs> horror fan uh like i love the grudge too <laughs> like I think it's amazing. Anyway, um and i hated juan sorry i i and I didn't like the ring. I thought they were boring uh, or like Ringu, but I, uh, I love it when Americans get involved. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> now, uh, Hakita who made ultra kill, uh, brought to my attention. There was a TV movie of Ringu before the J horror version of Ringu. The one that came out in like 2000, 2001. And this one came out in the nineties and it very closely follows the book. So if you're a true J horror fan, you, you will have watched that. It's available on YouTube. Just, you know, some pirated version, mm. but yeah, uh, hereditary, um, from start to finish was a genuinely scary film for me that scared me. It was one of those films where I was afraid to drive home at night afterwards. Hereditary um, freaks me out every time I watch it because evil wins, <laughs> evil wins. Exactly. And I love to me, that's always been one of the most terrifying demonic depictions in film because oh, they get it. So right they in do my it opinion. so well, how like they the trick cult, her into thinking, yes. into thinking she's uh, doing a seance and contacting her, her um daughter and when her daughter comes through she has a completely different tone of voice and personality than the daughter that we thought was her daughter this whole time yeah you know and then they trick her into burning the book which lights her husband on fire that is such a <laughs> terrifying crushing moment you know and of course that's when that's when she's fully that's when she gets possessed open, yeah. fully open to the influence you know and all that stuff all the payment symbology and stuff it was it's just horrifying and I, I god i love it the cinematography you know that flips upside down in the hallway yep. when she visits um i want to say aunt lydia from uh handmaid's tale but it's, it's the actress um yeah what's her face you know who kind of guides her through that it's just how manipulative that lady is when she like catches her in the parking lot like there's so much stuff mm -hmm. in it that's so so good the, the way it's that scary. like they saw their heads off and like yeah, uh, yeah. That, uh, bothers me so much reminds me of a yeah, certain the someone who likes to mess with cult members heads <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, yeah the um the imagery of losing one's head you know and stuff like that there's even a part where she like sees the it, the guy does does it so is this um this is ari aster isn't it's it ari no, aster, who is yeah. it it's aster. yeah ari aster because he did because he did midsummer, midsummer which I, yeah. I did not enjoy so much mm. um but i'm looking forward to his next stuff you know yeah and um did he do Bo is afraid he did Bo is afraid I... as well oh, okay yeah. All right. yeah i i don't know i couldn't get into that one but hereditary man was just so effective you know in my opinion and yeah uh, the the music and stuff is like nothing i've ever heard you know in a horror film um you know the conjuring and stuff is just fun you know and people will say what they want about ed and lorraine warren they, they just needed people to play the investigators you know sure sure i don't know if they were fraud but, um yeah like what else did i what else have i watched recently that i really liked um 
there is this wild movie that I saw on Shutter. Uh, I think it was called The Medium, and it's about uh, I think it's is it Filipino or Malaysian? I gotta look it up. But the second half of the movie isn't wasn't as effective. Let's see, Medium. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a uh, Thai Thai slash South Korean. Mm. It's it's a mockumentary. Yeah, it's in Thailand. And the first half of the film is this shaman who who performs exorcisms, uh, and it's basically just like a document, like a pseudo documentary of her life, and then um, it kind of goes downhill from there. But I, I thought that that one was really creepy. Uh, the Wailing, um, which is I think a Korean or is it Thai again? Um, yeah, it's Korean. Um, that was a pretty good like spiritual. Um, Satan Slaves, which is an Indonesian film, I think, uh, I thought was pretty good. Um, the The Exorcist Three, I think, is cooler than the first Exorcist. Sorry, don't come at me. <laughs> um, and then Paranormal Three and our Paranormal Activity series, I think, are really fun. Um, you know, that one follows Paranormal Activity Three is like pretty, actually, pretty deep, like. Um, how they like manipulate there's characters in the film who you think are innocuous but they actually kind of are manipulating them the whole time yeah um there's a really interesting a24 film called the black coat's daughter that has uh the amazing emma roberts and Mm -hmm. um the girl who's in sabrina the live action series yeah Uh, she was in mad men um the black coat's daughter is a really interesting kind of like very minimalist horror film that deals with um satanic possession and stuff um yeah i don't know uh and oh i like a folk horror a lot so like wicker man type Mm -hmm. stuff like um there was a a film on shutter called impedagor that was really cool um the fur the the prologue of the empty man i thought was really good i don't know i'm just kind of geeking out on some horror films that i really liked but um yeah, it's like very few films really catch my attention on the whole demonic possession thing. Most of the time, it's like The Conjuring, you know, where it's just like, you know, spewing blood and crawling on the walls and stuff. But I really liked Hereditary because it really, it felt real and authentic, which was a which is a big compliment. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Big fan of it. Um, all right. Well, on that note, there, I also took questions from like people on Twitter, but we really covered all of them. <laughs> <laughs> like all the good ones I wrote down that I was like, yeah, oh, I, I should ask them. him that. Like you nailed it. Like there are questions about audio design, monster design, stuff like that. Like and we we really hit all those points. I think. Yeah. Tell what's their face that the sex update will be in September. <laughs> <laughs> I'll get right on that. <laughs> Don't yeah, you yeah. worry. <laughs> uh, yeah, like uh, DLCs and sequels and other like faithful related projects are definitely gonna happen it's just you know the unholy trinity took me seven years to create to finish so like don't expect it anytime sure sure absolutely Uh, Uh, oh yeah we're working on console ports they'll probably come out next year awesome awesome yeah there are a bunch of people asking about the switch release when that'll happen and stuff it's gonna happen it's just we got we got priorities and stuff of course Uh, understandable well very cool well the last thing i want to ask is you kind of you you gave it away a bit which is why i press on it a little you mentioned a faith chapter four and you just said like things like dlc and whatnot is there anything you can tell us at this point about what they may be like or maybe how to expect it or something similar um if you really like games like resident evil and silent hill like the classic survival horror experience then you're gonna then you're gonna really enjoy it oh, um, let's go so ready yeah i'm gonna it's gonna be um I've already got it kind of planned out. I just haven't started working on it. Um, So I I hope people like it. I think it'll give, it'll answer some questions and then create a lot more questions. Perfect. I'm ready. Not everything's going to be. That's exactly what I'm looking for. (laughs) Uh, And of course, of course I'm going to try to make it really scary. The thing with these games is that I worked on chapter three for so long that it it's, I was having major doubts that it was actually a scary game because I, I'd been going through those moments for years you know like playing through them fixing bugs and try to trying to tweak and adjust them and i was having major doubts by the time i released it i was like is this game even scary like i have no idea and uh, luckily the guys at new blood you know who are watching me like 
post clips and stuff on it where very supportive and they're like no 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 it's it's terrifying dude you're messed up like <laughs> keep going you know <laughs> so, um i'm hoping to do not not something new with chapter four but expand on certain mechanics that i think players will enjoy having seen expanded fantastic i'm i'm very excited for that well very cool my man uh, i believe that should do everything uh, above all else, I just want to say thank you so much for this recording and lending me your time. I greatly appreciate it. I know my audience greatly appreciates it. Uh, before we go, is there anything you want to plug or shout out or upcoming releases or anything of that nature? Um, hmm. Yeah. Um, I would love there to be a faith film, but there's nothing official yet. We'll see how uh, Iron Lung does. <laughs> Maybe I'll, I'll bug Markiplier and see if he wants to do something with that. Um, I've had several producers and directors and writers reach out to me, but nothing's really kind of come up yeah. come of it. Yeah. Um, I actually was contacted by the producer of The Ring, the American remake. He was like the guy that brought all of those J-horror remakes to, you know, to mm, Hollywood. Wow. And we talked about it quite a bit, and he actually sent a... Um, a one pager to a, a director um but uh, nothing really happened there but i i i think that someday there'll be a, a game of it uh, cool. it makes a lot of sense to have it and um absolutely yeah what else what else um i'm working on uh a horror game that's produced by jesse cox and it's featuring a, a pretty popular content creator on tiktok and i'm sure everybody can figure that out but mm. um we're working on it we're trying to get a demo out by October, so I'll have a new, brand new game demo out in October. Awesome. Um, awesome. Watch out for September 21st this year. We're going to have a, a fun update for y'all. And um, yeah, just thank you to everyone who's played the game and uh, who supported me. I, I love the indie horror community. Like, there's so, so many unique voices, you know, from it. Mm. And um, I am. Uh, I want to get to the point where I can support young creators like people supported me. A few people supported me when I was real young in the game or in this game. Mm -hmm. I still think I'm young in the game, but, um, you know, as long as I'm like semi considered an influencer or a influential voice in this in this circle, you know, I want to find ways to like get give back. And, you know, eventually I'll have enough capital to like hire people to like work for me. So I, I think that'd be kind of cool. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm already contracting out. Um, a fellow fellow game dev um to work on a demo that i want to have out um but yeah several several projects air dwarf related projects coming up in the future so stay tuned and uh thank you for your patience i know it's like hard to like wait for things that you're excited about i got i got so many dms about when is chapter three <laughs> when is chapter three i still get dms of where is chapter three because <laughs> under a rock or something but now it's like i get like five or six messages asking for the switch release every day and stuff. <laughs> hey well i can say on behalf of the indie horror community thank you very much for making these games we appreciate <laughs> it and i promise whatever you come out with next we are going to be front row for it all right uh, but on that note uh, i'll go ahead and uh stop the interview here everyone thank you so much for stopping by and checking this out uh, be sure to follow air dwarf on social media and above all else go check out faith he deserves the support and the game deserves your attention um, so <laughs> go do that very nice of you absolutely you more than deserve it my guy check out air dwarf and be ready for the full video about faith which will be coming very soon and if you're over here watching this interview because I linked it, then ignore that last part or just rewatch it again, whatever you want. <laughs> uh, but I believe that should do it for now. Again, thank you very much, Airdorf, for being a part of this. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was fun. This was a good one. Appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, I believe that should do it for now. But I just want to say thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. Also, remember, remember, Gary loves you.